Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Heian Park, the manager of the Health and Ecosystem Analysis Section in the Research Division at CARB. This is a public meeting to discuss research on air pollution health outcomes and valuation. And first, I'd like to introduce Elizabeth Shealy, the Chief of Research Division at CARB, and she will provide some back opening remarks. Thank you, Heyin. As Heyin said, I'm Elizabeth Shealy. I'm the Chief of the Research Division. And I'd just like to welcome everybody for taking the time to attend our public meeting today to discuss research on air pollution health outcomes and valuation. CARB is dedicated to the mission of improving public health and welfare as we pursue air pollution reductions. And over the years, we have quantified the benefits of our rules, plans, and programs using the best information available to help the board and the public better understand how our work contributes to improved public health. As our scientific understanding of air pollution health impacts has grown dramatically over the years, there's much more information on health impacts and valuations that we can consider in our health analysis. We're pleased to be able to hear today from several experts on health research and benefits valuation approaches, and we're also pleased to be able to have panel discussions with several health experts following the presentations. We'll be introducing our health expert panelists shortly. So I just want to thank you again for joining us. I'm excited to have this meeting and hear the discussion and the public comment. Now I'm going to ask Bonnie Holmes Jen to provide just some additional comments before we get started. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, and good morning, everyone. I'm Bonnie Holmes Jen, Branch Chief of the Health and Exposure Assessment Branch in the Research Division, and thank you so much for attending today. We're very excited about the agenda. I have a few overview comments as we get started. Today's meeting is part of our expanded health analysis work in the Research Division, and the purpose of today's meeting is to hear presentations and discussion of scientific research that can inform CARB's health analysis. And, and to hear important input from scientific experts into new approaches for understanding and quantifying where possible the health benefits of emission reduction programs. I wanted to clarify that there are no agency decisions being made today, and this meeting is not part of a regulatory process. The scientific panelists that we've invited to share their views are presenting their individual perspectives and ideas on health analysis and valuation. The discussion between the expert panelists and presenters is intended to inform CARB about new and important research and approaches to health analysis that will be considered in future work, but any decisions on changes to our methodology would undergo a separate public process. Please note that there will be time reserved for public comment, as will be discussed shortly. However, there will not be time today for back and forth between the scientific experts and the public and CARB will not be able to provide detailed responses to individual comments. We will be considering all comments presented both orally and in writing, and there will be a public docket. In addition to the planned discussion periods after the presentations, scientific experts will have time at the end to make closing comments. And if they choose, they can address any items brought up in the public comment in their close. Thanks so much. And next I'd like to introduce, or like to go back to Heyoon Park. Um, to move us forward on the agenda. Dr. Park and Dr. Betra-Atana will continue uh, to move us forward. Thank you, Elizabeth and Bonnie. Now I'd like to turn it over to the staff lead, Dr. May Betra-Atana, to provide the agenda for the meeting today and some background information to start the meeting. May, take it away. Great, thank you, Dr. Park. So before we begin, I would like to remind everybody that today's meeting is being recorded. Uh, the slides for today, they will be posted later on the website. We do have to make them ADA compliant before we post them, but all registrants will receive a notice when they are posted. And also, if you do have any technical issues during the meeting, please email my colleague, Dr. Arash Moheg. His email is on the screen, and I'll be posting it in the chat. So email him only for technical Zoom issues, and uh, please save any comments on the actual meeting topics for a public comment period at the end. All right. Let me just post his email in the chat real quick. Okay. 
So today's agenda is divided into three main sections. Uh, first, we'll have presentations on research on air pollution and health outcomes and community health issues. We'll have four presentations, each about 10 to 15 minutes long. Uh, the presentations will be followed by an approximately 45 minute long panel discussion with our scientific health experts who you will meet shortly. And then we'll have a 10 minute break and then come back where you'll, you'll hear presentations on approaches for health benefit valuation. We'll have two presentations here, each also speaking for about 10 to 15 minutes on their topic. And this will be followed by an approximately 30 minute long panel discussion. And finally, our meeting will conclude with a period for public comment and then closing statements by CARB and the health expert panelists. So if you wish to provide public comment during our public comment period, you may raise your hand to be added to the speaking queue. You may raise your hand at any time, but leave it raised until you're called upon to provide your comment during the public comment period at the end. Note that the comments are limited to two minutes. If you wish to provide a written comment, we will have a public comment submission link on our meeting website. It is not yet open, but registrants will receive a notice when this is open for submissions. And with that, I'll go ahead and dive into the background for today's meeting. Uh, the purpose of our meeting today is to hear about science in the area of air pollution and health, and to specifically better understand the current available research and methodologies to assess and quantify health outcomes and benefits. Before we talk about the research and the analysis, it's first helpful to define what are health endpoints. A health endpoint is an adverse health outcome used for the purposes of evaluating quantitative or qualitative health impacts. And examples include mortality and morbidity effects, such as premature deaths or hospitalizations from air pollution exposure. Health endpoints can be used to evaluate the impacts from criteria air pollutants or air toxics, such as diesel particulate matter. For today's meeting, though, we are focusing on those related to PM 2.5, although there may be also discussion of other pollutants in our presentations today. CARB routinely conducts health analysis to inform the benefits of the agency's regulations, plans, and programs. Our current quantitative analysis approach analyzes the reduction in the number of adverse health cases and provides monetization for those health endpoints, including cardiopulmonary mortality, hospitalizations for heart and lung causes, and emergency room visits for asthma. This is just a small subset of the full suite of benefits for PM 2.5. CARB also conducts qualitative analysis by summarizing the health effects and providing directional analyses based on the literature. An example of this analysis was thoroughly described in Appendix G of the 2022 scoping plan focused on public health. As mentioned on the previous slide, we are only capturing a portion of the health benefits of air pollution reductions. However, since a board resolution in April of 2020, CARB staff have been pursuing ongoing work to update our health analysis, with our goal being to provide a more complete evaluation of the health benefits of the agency's air quality actions. And we are doing this through looking at new qualitative and quantitative approaches, assessing health impacts in disadvantaged communities, quantifying additional pollutants, updating health endpoints from air pollution exposure, and assessing and communicating greenhouse gas reduction benefits. As part of this effort to update our health analysis, uh, recently CARB staff expanded the number of PM 2.5 health endpoints that we are quantifying, and this is based on US EPA's update of their BenMap tool. This expansion of our health analysis endpoints was described in our bulletin that was released November 2022 on our website, in which we will port, uh, post shortly in the chat. As you can see from this table, we updated three of our endpoints and have added eight new endpoints, covering different cardiovascular, respiratory, and neurological conditions. This expansion is just the initial phase of our project to expand our health analysis. As I mentioned, uh, this expansion was based on US EPA's work on the causality determinations between PM 2.5 and health impacts as described in their 2019 Integrated Science Assessment or ISA. The expanded list of endpoints on the previous slide covers those that have causality determinations of likely to be causal and causal. 
However, there are also several endpoints that are highlighted here that have evidence that were determined by the US EPA to be suggestive of but not sufficient to infer causality. And these endpoints are thus not yet covered in the quantitative analysis. We will be hearing more about these suggestive endpoints from our presentations today to learn more about the research and the need to understand how to quantify these. And speaking of research, uh, this shows various CARB-funded health research projects. The ones at the top were recently completed. And we have several ongoing ones as well, including on birth outcomes, children's neurodevelopment, and metabolic outcomes. In fact, some of the presenters you'll hear from today are part of a couple of these projects that are going on. And lastly, we are looking forward to other health contracts that are upcoming. All of the health work mentioned previously is being undertaken or managed by the staff in three sections of the health branch who are all listed here. We have the health and ecosystems analysis section, the building and indoor environment section, and the climate and health analysis and library services section in our branch. As mentioned in the agenda for today's meeting, uh, following each set of presentations, we will have panel discussions with our scientific health expert panelists who are listed here. And before we begin the main presentations, we'll actually have each of them uh, briefly introduce themselves. So first, we'll start with Dr. Hertz Pichotto. Hi, I'm Irva Hertz Pichotto. I'm at the University of California, Davis. I'm a professor in the Department of Public Health Sciences and I direct our um, NIEHS-funded Environmental Health Sciences Center. Happy to be here. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jarrett? Hello, my name is Michael Jarrett. I'm a professor of environmental health science at UCLA and co-director of the Center for Healthy Climate Solutions and director of the Center for Occupational Environmental Health. And I've been involved in health impact assessment and burden assessment for many years now including some uh, projects that are ongoing with the Air Resources Board. Thank you. And Dr. McConnell? I'm Rob McConnell. I'm a physician and environmental epidemiologist. I'm a professor of population and public health sciences in the medical school at USC. I've doing, been doing air pollution epidemiology for over, over 20 years, and I have some experience in effects on respiratory, cardio, cardiometabolic, and, uh, and uh, neurologic neurodevelopmental outcomes, primarily uh, looking at, at children. Thank you. Dr. Quintana? Hi, my name is Penelope Quintana. I'm a professor in the Division of Environmental Health at the School of Public Health at San Diego State University. And I've had the privilege of working with some of the AB 617 communities um, funded through CARB and uh, very interested in community environmental justice. Thank you. Happy to be here. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Shema Sunder, I'm actually not sure if she is in. I did not see her in. If not, uh, we'll go to Dr. Woodruff. Hello, I'm Tracy Woodruff. I am a professor in the School of Medicine at University of California, San Francisco. And um, my research is focused on exposures during pregnancy and adverse birth outcomes, as well as characterizing exposure and how to advance methods for evaluating environmental health evidence for decision making. Thank you, everybody. All right, so with that, we can dive into the first set of presentations, which will focus on research on air pollution and health outcomes and community health issues. So we have four presentations today, and here are our presenters. So first, we'll start with Dr. Rupa Basu. She is the chief of the Air and Climate Epidemiology Section in the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment, or OEHA. Dr. Bessu has published extensively on research focusing on examining temperature and air pollution on health outcomes, including mortality, morbidity, and adverse birth outcomes, while identifying vulnerable subgroups. Prior to joining OEHA, she worked at the U.S. Environmental 
Protection Agency. She was featured in the Emmy award-winning climate change documentary, Years of Living Dangerously, Mercury Rising episode with Matt Damon. Dr. Basu's work is widely cited and has received a lot of media attention, including the New York Times, the New Yorker, LA Times, SF Chronicle, National Public Radio, and BBC World News. Dr. Bessie, I will turn it over to you now. Thank you so much for that introduction. Let me see if I'm gonna try to share my slides. Can everyone see this? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. You can make it uh, full screen. Yeah, actually, hold on a second. Um, it's kind of... Hmm. Trying to move this down. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I'm having some trouble making this full screen because I can't see the top at the very top. So let me see if I can. All right. Um, may, maybe it's better for you to go ahead and share your slides since mine's not. No Maybe problem. I'm... Okay, thank you. Let me go back. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so in the next few slides, I'm going to uh, present some work on air pollution and adverse birth outcomes and really focus on the work that um, we've conducted at OEHA in the past 10 or so years. Next slide, please. So um, here's a brief outline. I'm gonna give an introduction to OEHA followed by, uh, next, I have a lot of animations, um, overview of OES research. Um, and that's really gonna consist mostly of PM two and a half and constituents, um, disproportionate effects on my minority communities, critical exposure windows during uh, gestational periods, and then I threw in a slide on mental health impacts of PM2.5, just because that's some of the emerging research that we've worked on, um, potential biological mechanisms, and then finally, a summary slide. Okay, so I've worked at OEHA for the last 17 years. In the last nine years, I've been the section chief of our air and climate epidemiology section. And the first question I often get asked is, what is OEHA? So I thought I would start with this. Um, so in our section, uh, we are a group of epidemiologists, uh, biostatisticians, exposure scientists, and then also have a toxicologist. Um, most of OEHA consists of toxicologists, so we're a little bit different. Um, and uh, I've highlighted in red uh, what I'm going to present is really more of the epidemiologic research, but we are also um, um, leading research on um, climate change and evaluations um, from the climate indicators report. Um, we have some EJ evaluations, uh, risk assessments, biomonitoring, uh, pesticide work, uh, Prop 65, as well as Cal Envirus Screen. So uh, the first study I'm gonna uh, present is on PM2.5 and, and PM2.5 and constituents. We look at the constituents just to look at sources and um, other constituents that might be more responsible for the association and the PM2.5 mass itself. And we have found that um, with low birth weight, um, full gestational exposure to PM2.5 as well as the constituents are significantly associated with reductions in terms of low birth weight. But we have also found that specific PM2.5 constituents such as sulfur, sulfur dioxide um, and vanadium, zinc, copper, some of the traffic related pollutants have had the greatest impacts. Um, and an important finding is that the reductions in birth weight were generally larger among younger mothers and it varied by race and ethnicity. And then, okay. The next um, study I'd like to present is on uh, PM2.5 and constituents. It's very similar to the previous study, except that this time we're looking at preterm delivery and um, short-term exposure versus long-term exposure from the term birth weight. Again, we found very similar um, associations between PM2.5 and the constituents that were most highly associated 
or again, some of the traffic related uh, pollutants, um, also ammonium uh, nitrate, et cetera. So um, there's greater association for some uh, race ethnic groups, such as black, Asian, also older um, maternal age, um, some college education. And looking at gestational uh, weeks, we found that it was actually 32 to 34 weeks that was at greater risk. In this study, we uh, had defined preterm exposure or preterm delivery as uh, 20 to 36 uh, gestational weeks. So this is really towards the end of that period. Next slide, please. So uh, we also um, are fortunate to uh, do a lot of external uh, collaborations. So this next uh, study is really more focused on uh, work that we've done with the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. And they have also looked at some of the uh, differences by race, ethnicity, and found that infants born to non-Hispanic uh, Black people were um, more likely uh, to be affected from um, reduced birth weight from PM2.5 exposure, which is in line with our findings from the previous study that I showed you. Okay, um, I think it needs, this one's got a little bit of animation, so just one more, okay. And um, so we're not really focusing so much on coarse particles here, but I did wanna point out that coarse particles, uh, and that's uh, PM10 minus PM2.5, also uh, vary uh, by socioeconomic status and low birth weight, um, and um, really varies across risk um, by region and um, uh, socioeconomic subgroup in California. Next slide. Um, I'm going back to critical windows of exposure um, because it's really important to kind of tease out what is the most critical window of exposure so that we can focus more on preventive efforts. And um, we're seeing here that for preterm birth, it really is not just the short-term exposure that I had suggested before, but also full pregnancy exposure that is associated with preterm birth. And in this study, uh, preterm birth uh, was defined a little differently. Um, it was less than 37 gestational weeks in this uh, study with also with done with scripts. And the most vulnerable weeks were 17 to 24 weeks, which we hadn't found before. And then also 36 weeks, which is pretty close to uh, what we um, reported earlier. So um, for stillbirth, um, we looked at both long-term and short-term exposures. And stillbirth is more than, in California, more than 20 gestational weeks of fetal death, more than 20 gestational weeks. So we found that it was not only the entire pregnancy that was most associated with both PM2.5 and, and um, NO2 or nitrogen dioxide, but it's also the third trimester that was uh, most uh, highly associated. But short-term, we actually found not as much of an association with PM2.5 in this study, but other pollutants such as um, sulfur dioxide, ozone, and again, the coarse particles that were more uh, strongly associated. And I think we're gonna get that, yeah. These are the references for those studies. Okay, so it's really important after looking at so, many, so much literature out there to kind of, um, review the evidence and kind of give a general consensus on what the study results are showing us. And um, there have been so many reviews on this topic, but I focused on this one uh, because I uh, it was published just a couple years ago and it did look at air pollution as well as heat exposure. By air pollutants, I mean PM2.5 and, and ozone and the adverse birth outcomes that were covered were all of the ones that I just presented on preterm birth, low birth weight, which is less than uh, 2,500 um, grams, and then also stillbirth in the US. It was a systematic review and it included most of the research, research from uh, 2007 to 2019. And it did have um, a very strong uh, association for at least 57 of the 68 studies that we looked at between all these exposures and these outcomes. 
But it is really important that we again solve these disparities by race, ethnicity, some pre existing conditions such as asthma. And here's a quick overview of a mental health study that we published recently. This is uh, for PM2.5 um, specifically, but we do have other um, work on um, other air pollutants. So you can see here that, um, and the outcomes that we really focused on were the ones that we had enough data to, to look at. So all mental health outcomes, homicides, and inflicted injury, neurotic disorders, depression, suicide, and bipolar disorder. You can see that uh, there are different lags that we considered. So same day, as well as seven day and a slightly longer lag. Um, and all mental health outcomes were uh, more short-term um, associated as well as homicides and neurotic disorders, whereas depression, uh, suicide, or bipolar disorders were uh, more associated with uh, week-long exposures of PM2.5 or NO2. Um, so I talked a lot about the short-term and long-term effects um, of PM2.5, and there's a lot of overlap, but it's important that um, to just point out some of the physiologic mechanisms for short-term impacts are um, headache, nose, throat, eyes, inflammation, coughing, painful breathing, pneumonia, bronchitis, and skin, skin irritation. These are just some examples, but you can see it's a lot of respiratory impacts. Long-term, we also see those respiratory impacts, but then there are also some cardiovascular effects. Um, and we see some of that in the short term too. So it's really hard, like I said, to um, tease them apart. There's also some uh, liver um, and spleen, um, blood um, metabolic disorders, um, impacts on the reproductive system, which we know are both also short-term and long-term. Just some of the different mechanisms. So here are the main um, take home um, messages. Um, summary, um, air pollutants, um, particularly PM2.5 are associated with out, um, adverse birth outcomes. In California, we see a lot of uh, disparities by maternal age, but also by race and ethnicity, particularly among non-Hispanic black people. Um, the full pregnancy exposure has been found to have in many cases, the strongest impact, but that does vary by study. Um, and there are some gestational weeks or trimesters that are uh, higher risk. And it's just really important to explore and identify critical windows of exposure um, and consider both short and long-term particulate matter exposure. And um, just finally, uh, we know from recent evidence that PM2.5 also exac exacerbates mental health impacts. That's it, thank you so much. Great, thank you, Dr. Basu. All right, our next speaker is Dr. Stephanie Holm. Uh, she is the director of the Western States Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit and an assistant clinical professor in the UCSF Division of Occupational Environmental and Climate Medicine. Dr. Holm received her medical degree in 2011 from the University of Pittsburgh and her PhD in 2021 in environmental epidemiology at UC Berkeley. She is board certified in both pediatrics and occupational environmental medicine. She is the director of the Western States Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit, which works on education and research translation of environmental health topics for the public. Her ongoing research activities include work on outdoor air pollution and its effects on metabolic and neurologic outcomes in children, as well as work on cooking related indoor air pollution and associated health effects in children. All right, so Dr. Holm, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that introduction, May, really appreciate it. Give me one half a second while I pull up my slides, everybody. <clears throat> All right, um, thank you so much for having me here to speak today. Um, as May said, I'm uh, covering neurodevelopmental health outcomes from air pollution. Uh, so quick outline, uh, we'll go over some of the mechanisms of how uh, various pollutants can affect neurodevelopment. Uh, we'll talk about air pollution effects on the brain throughout the life course. We'll talk about why children are particularly vulnerable. That's sort of my MO. Uh, and we'll talk about neurodevelopmental effects of air pollution exposure prenatally and in childhood, and then uh, touch on some of my work in the area. 
So really quick, just on mechanisms, one of the ways that uh, PM 2.5, as well as uh, some of the other pollutants can affect um, the uh, neuro neurologic system, um, as well as neural development, is by increasing permeability of the blood-brain barrier. And that's particularly problematic because we know that a variety of these pollutants actually have direct effects on neurons. Uh, that includes, you know, direct toxicity like oxidative stress, um, epigenetic changes, uh, changes in myelination have been seen in mice, um, so a variety of effects. And the other way that uh, the other mechanism of effect here is that you can have systemic inflammation uh, that results from uh, air pollutant exposure to the lungs, spillover of inflammation systemically uh, that can then lead to neuroinflammation. So there's sort of a variety of ways in which uh, exposure to criteria air pollutants as well as toxic air pollutants uh, can affect neurodevelopment. So there's been a lot of work actually showing neurocognitive effects of PM across the life course. Um, Project Tender, uh, targeting environmental neurodevelopmental risks, um, which uh, is a group of academics and health professionals and children's environmental health advocates have actually identified combustion related pollutants as a key target for policies to protect brain development in kids. Uh, and as was mentioned earlier, in the EPA integrated science assessment for PM 2.5, um, uh, it was designated that there's a likely causal relationship between long-term PM 2.5 exposure and nervous system effects as well as suggestive for short-term effects. Um, interestingly, uh, there was a study just published last year looking at uh, MRI findings in Dutch children, um, huge, huge study, thousands of kids, um, and found that even though there are no changes in uh, total white or gray matter, um, there were changes in the size of specific structures and connections between them uh, based on PM 2.5 exposure. So some uh, you know, interesting, interesting imaging findings just coming out recently. All right, so let's touch on why kids are particularly vulnerable. Uh, you know, this is true for uh, a variety of environmental exposures, but including air pollution. Kids have differences in their physiology that increase the dose that they get. So, um, you know, relative to, to adults, children have an increased respiratory rate um, compared to their size uh, and a potentially leakier blood brain barrier to begin with. So in addition to air pollution increasing that leakiness, kids may have a, a leakier blood brain barrier anyways. Uh, Two is that kids have unique windows of growth and development. And, you know, this is something that most people are familiar with. Um, but because of this, you know, you'll have periods like the fetal period or periods throughout childhood where, where kids are rapidly growing and changing. And if you have uh, an insult that affects growth, you can have lifelong effects that are really outsized um, by changing that growth trajectory, um, as opposed to not that adults are entirely a static system, but as opposed to uh, an exposure that affects a more static system like adults. And then third is that kids have behaviors and preferences that increase their exposures to a lot of environmental uh, toxicants, including air pollution. So for example, kids tend to run and play and uh, be outdoors a lot more, uh, you know, working at a higher metabolic rate because they're running. And that's a good thing, right? They spend more time outside than I do here at my desk. Uh, but it, it can also mean that they get higher air pollutant exposures. All right, so touching on what we know about neurocognitive effects of prenatal exposures, uh, there uh, is the most literature about cognitive effects. Um, so there have been a number of studies that have shown decreases in intelligence in preschool age children associated with prenatal exposure to a variety of air pollutants. Um, so including particulate matter, black carbon, uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, and nitrogen dioxide. Uh, I will note that there's, there's uh, some mixed evidence. There was a large pooling of European birth cohorts that did not find neurodevelopmental effects of neuro exposure. Um, certainly there was some, some potential for exposure misclassification in that study. Uh, so, you know, worth ongoing work, but there's quite a lot to suggest that this is, uh, this is an issue. Other than cognition, there have been a number of other neuro, uh, neurodevelopmental effects seen with prenatal exposure to air pollution. So things like uh, increases in uh, autism diagnoses, 
particularly associated with uh, the perinatal periods, both prenatal and in early infancy. Uh, some changes in motor skills. So uh, both gross motor, you know, that's your running, climbing, jumping, uh, and fine motor skills, uh, the, the sorts of things you do with your hands. Um, and then there also, as uh, Rupa noted, uh, there are associations with preterm birth and low birth weight. And of course, those things are also associated with neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, and so it may be that another way in which air pollutants cause neurodevelopmental changes is, is via preterm birth or, or uh, low birth weight. Interestingly, there was just actually a recent study showing that uh, cognitive effects are not mediated through preterm birth, um, but it could still well be that some of these other ones, autism, uh, et cetera, are. And then similarly to the evidence for prenatal uh, exposures, the um, strongest evidence in childhood exposures is also for cognitive effects. Uh, PM 2.5 exposure has been seen, has been associated in many studies with decrements in childhood cognitive function, uh, measured a few different ways, um, and including looking at school performance, uh, that schools that are closer to traffic sources that have higher air pollutant exposures, uh, have, those children tend to score lower on various uh, standardized tests and, and other ways of measuring learning. Uh, in addition, there's been some uh, there's been some work looking at attention uh, that there's increased risk of hyperactivity and inattention in kids who uh, have higher PM 2.5 exposure, and there's starting to be some work looking at who is particularly at risk. Um, so uh, people who uh, have the APOE4 allele, um, which is also the the uh, a uh, lipoprotein that's been associated with Alzheimer's. There's a lot of work associating uh, that particular uh, genetic um, polymorphism with Alzheimer's. The kids that have that uh, also have a higher chance of having attention effects um, from PM 2.5 exposure. So, you know, definitely uh, some interesting stuff happening in terms of who is most at risk of these effects. And then there's some behavior effects seen as well. So um, for example, in adolescence, uh, delinquent behavior has been associated with PM 2.5 levels. So touching a bit on some of my work in the last few years um, related to neurodevelopment, uh, I had the pleasure of working with some of the Chamacos folks. That's the Center for Health Assessment of Mothers and Children of Salinas. That's a pediatric birth cohort that's been followed for the last gosh, 24 years now. Um, so I guess initially pediatric birth cohort, they're now young adults. Um, primarily that study looked at pesticide exposures and a variety of other exposures. Um, they had not previously been able to assess air pollutant contributions. Uh, and so I worked with folks uh, over the last few years, we used some uh, older satellite data and various things to estimate PM 2.5 concentrations throughout the Salinas Valley, where the Chamacos cohort is located, um, and looked at prenatal air pollution exposures at the residential address where the pregnant parent was living during pregnancy, um, and then childhood IQ. Uh, and so um, this is a graph showing some of our key findings. On the y-axis, you're looking at estimated differences in IQ points. Um, associated with a three microgram per cubic meter interval of PM 2.5. So, you know, relatively small. This is the difference of, you know, being slightly or closer further from, slightly closer or further from a freeway. Uh, and one of the things that we saw was that decreases in childhood IQ with this PM 2.5 exposure in utero um, were relatively impressive. So in full scale IQ, more than a point difference. And this was measured at age 10 and a half. So these are kids who, you know, a decade later, uh, you were seeing relatively large differences. Um, there were particularly strong effects seen for mid to late pregnancy um, and some differences in the patterns of effect between groups using the sex of the child assigned at birth, um, both in terms of which subscales were more affected uh, and in the timing of the exposure. Um, and, you know, as a reminder, a, a point and a half of IQ may not seem like a big deal for an individual child, but if you have an entire population curve that's being shifted by a point and a half, 
Um, you can really have huge differences in, you know, the number of people that qualify for services, um, lifetime earning potential for that whole population, you know, really large societal population effects, um, even if it seems like it's not uh, as large for an individual. And then uh, May mentioned that uh, some of us are, are working on some ongoing projects with CARB. Uh, so one of the ones that is kicking off just now that CARB funded uh, is this project called CHAP Stack. Um, so I'm one of the collaborators on the Children's Health and Air Pollution Study in the San Joaquin Valley. Um, and we are kicking off uh, a neurodevelopment uh, component to this project called Standardized Assessments and Cognition in Kids. Uh, this project will have four components. So we're gonna do a systematic review of air pollutant exposure and standardized test scores, then look at PM 2.5 and diesel and traffic density in California schools um, and regress that on standardized test performance. Obviously, standardized tests have a variety of uh, problems associated with them, you know, various biases with different groups. Um, but one of the reasons that it, it can be cool to use them is that this is really statewide data, right, that, that represents all of the children in California. Uh, and so there, there are some uh, cool advantages to doing that. But then we'll zoom into our CHAPS cohort um, in the San Joaquin Valley and do a more detailed assessment with those kids. So looking at not only their standardized test performance uh, on prior tests, but also assessments of cognition and attention and behavior and mood um, and be able to associate those with PM 2.5 and nitrogen dioxide, polycystic aromatic hydrocarbons uh, and black carbon. Um, and then, you know, using all of that, be able to estimate some of the benefits to California of um, improvements in air pollution related to neurodevelopmental changes. All right, so summary, there is consistent evidence of neurodevelopmental effects from both prenatal and childhood exposure to air pollution for long-term effects. Uh, there are some for short-term as well. Definitely some further exploration is needed to describe magnitudes of effects um, and particularly critical windows, particularly sensitive populations, durations of effects. Uh, you know, there's, there's still enough of a suggestion here for all of these things that it is well worth CARB uh, you know, taking action. I think the most health protective thing to do for our children and, and for all of us is to, uh, you know, act as soon as there's suggestive evidence of effects. Um, just a reminder that shifting the entire distribution of cognition can have huge societal effects um, and that effects on cognition and neurodevelopmental disorders can have lifelong impacts um, that affect, you know, an individual's health and quality of life, um, but also have huge, huge effects for our state as a whole. And shout out to a bunch of my collaborators on a variety of projects, uh, including the ones that I, I mentioned here today. Thanks. Great, thanks, Dr. Holm. Let me share my screen. All right, so our next speaker is Dr. Sadir Alkindi. He is a cardiologist and assistant professor at Case Western Reserve University. Dr. Alkindi is a cardiologist and clinical translational researcher in environmental health effects and cardiovascular prevention. So Dr. Alkindi, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you so much. And let me just pull up the slides here. Thank you so much for tuning in and for inviting me to speak. Um, um, I'll, I'll be speaking about metabolic uh, disease today and uh, we'll be representing a little bit more of uh, mechanistic insights in addition to epidemiologic studies and panel studies to really cement our understanding of the impact of, uh, of air pollution specifically. And in the cardiometabolic space, we've always been really uh, ahead of the game, so to speak, compared with other um, um, uh, fields uh, when studying air pollution, um, with uh, exception of mortality. Uh, and that's because metabolic disease, cardiac disease affects a lot of individuals uh, throughout the United States and globally. I have no financial disclosures. Um, I have to admit that I am a, a part of the team that's funded by CARP currently that um, uh, is uh, led by the UC Berkeley project to investigate metabolic outcomes of air pollution exposure. And I'll be speaking a little bit about that today as well. 
So just so we can get a, a conceptual framework, how does air pollution really lead to um, cardiac effects, metabolic effects, and so on and so forth? A lot of the particles that we inhale actually don't uh, go to the blood uh, because they're relatively large, but some of it, in especially the ultrafine particles where there's a lot of evidence right now being developed uh, that can be picked up in the blood and in, in, in the organs as well. So. Uh, I'll be speaking mostly about PM 2.5, which is relatively larger uh, uh, particles when we talk about, uh, you know, it's a fine part, particle, particles. And the way we think about this, and this is based on conceptual, conceptual framework based on lots and lots of studies, both in mice and in, in humans, um, we inhale uh, air particles that are developed by, you know, throughout uh, multiple comb combustion fuel and other uh, sources, mostly anthropogenic uh, sources. And this leads to a, a three pathways. One is in the lung, it leads to inflammation. And this is where the immune cells come in and get activated and fighting off infections and other things. But uh, it sees these particles at, as being foreign to the body and then it starts getting activated. And then they carry out signals to the rest of the body and cause uh, downstream effects. There is, as I mentioned, there's a small portion uh, of the ultrafine particles, which is still a part of the PM 2.5 uh, that gets directly translocated. And there are some uh, human and animal studies that showed that we can pick up that, uh, pick up uh, some of these particles in the blood, in the, in the brain, and the liver and so on and so forth. But there is this concept of co called oxidative stress where the cells come in uh, and play with the, with the particles in the lung and it causes some uh, biologic pathway that really exhausts the cells and causes a stressful environment when it comes to oxidation of, uh, of uh, molecules and so on and so forth. And that leads to a variety of downstream effects. So as you can see here, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but you can see that there is some effects on the endothelial uh, function, which is this small layer of, of, of cells uh, that line our vascular system. It affects the brain, it affects the systemic inflammation, similar to what we see with COVID infection, for example, but at a smaller scale. Uh, and uh, thrombotic, which is clotting factors, and it leads also to autonomic dis the imbalance, which leads to heart, you know, heart rate changes and blood pressure changes, and so on and so forth. So, in conjunction, all of that really leads to cardiac effect, but also leads to metabolic effect. And we'll talk a little bit about that. This is a busy slide, and it's not meant to be. You know, I'm not going to go through details, but it just shows you the amount of work that has been that has happened. Uh, in uh, in the past three decades, uh, led by a lot of people, that really helps us understand the true mechanisms of how does uh, air pollution affects uh, um, uh, affects the uh, pancreas, affects the fat. Now we're starting to understand that it really impacts the fat as well, and that leads to insulin resistance, which is really the the proximate. Uh, mechanism for diabetes and, and, uh, and uh, uh, metabolic disease. But this shows you the type of organs that are affected by all of these different mechanisms that have been uh, elucidated previously in liver, the white adipose tissue, which is white fat, brown adipose tissue, which is brown fat, also skeletal muscles, so all the muscles in your body, um, vasculature, so blood vessels in the heart and other way, uh, everywhere else, and also uh, it leads to the buildup of uh, atherosclerosis, which is the plaque inside the arteries and leads to heart disease, strokes, and other things. When, how do we know that this is actually causal? How do we know that air pollution actually causes these things? Now, in humans, it's a little difficult, although there are a lot of studies, which I'll go through uh, in a bit, but it's the easiest thing is to do this in, in, in mice, right? So when you take mice and you put some mice in, in a cage and give them polluted air and you give the other group of mice filtered air. So this is PM 2.5 exposure. This is when we give them levels similar to what we see in Beijing and similar to what we see in New Delhi and areas that are relatively polluted. And we give the other group of mice filtered air, which is clean air. What we see even within minutes of exposure, you see that the glucose um, is higher in the, paper, in, the, in the mice that are exposed to filter to PM 2.5 compared with 
um, uh, filtered air. So if we give them glucose load, like give them a, a candy, but we give them a, a, a pre-determined uh, uh, amount of, of, of glucose of sugar, then we see that they are not able to handle the sugar as much as the filtered air uh, mice. And you can see the same thing with insulin. When we give them insulin to lower that amount of sugar, uh, the insulin doesn't work as well because the levels of sugar remains high. And when we look at the, their gene, um, and, and this is at the cell level, when we look at, at the different organs, we see that there are multiple pathways, biologic pathways that are upregulated, they're increased, they're activated. And this includes inflammation, uh, reactive ox oxidative stress, and this is what we talked about, cardiometabolic disease, glucose transport, and other things that really helps um, you know, mimic to a certain degree what we get with um, a high fat diet. So this is in here on the right side, you see high fat diet and there are some overlaps. So we, we uh, conclude that there are effects of air pollution that are causal in uh, diabetes and glucose mishandling that are related to and similar to what we get from high fat diet. Now, what do we know about humans? There are a lot of studies, but this is an example of how strict these studies are. We get patients, healthy college students, and this is study was done in China specifically, and they give them air filters at home. These are portable air filters that are devices, and they either give them a high filter uh, or a high impact filter, high efficiency filter called HEPA, or a sham indoor filtration. So they don't know whether they're getting filtered air or normal air that they're breathing from their uh, environment. And you can see after nine days of exposure and a 12 day washout, we see that there is, and we measure blood markers, we see that there's a lot of inflammatory markers that are uh, impacted by the, uh, uh, by, by the uh, exposure to polluted air compared with the filtered air. So there's approximately 40% increase in a lot of these inflammatory markers, including CRP, which is something we see in lupus and other conditions. But more importantly, uh, probably is the impact on insulin levels. So it increases insulin by about 40%, 30%. It increases glucose by about 10%. It increases this metric of insulin resistance by 30%. If you breathe polluted air compared with filtered air uh, using these air purifiers at home. So we know that this is because the the investigators are blinded, the participant is blinded, they don't know who's getting filtered or not. So this is a robust study is what we call it because it's randomized and nobody really knows who is getting what. And we only find out after we complete the study and do the measurements. So what is the conceptual framework right now? Of course, cardiometabolic disease or diabetes has multiple factors, and this includes genes and genetic predispositions, uh, also diet, and but also now we're trying to get an understanding of how multi-pollutants, in addition to PM 2.5, how other uh, co-pollutants can actually impact, uh, impact uh, cardiometabolic disease, and how does that interact with the social environment? How does that interact with your stress levels? with the culture and so on and so forth. So when you see, when I'm a clinician, I'm a, I'm a cardiologist and a cardiometabolic specialist, when I see patients in, in my clinic, I uh, always, we've always thought about thinking about the blood pressure and diet and physical activity and smoking and so on and so forth. What we call um, uh, traditional risk factors for heart disease and metabolic disease. But more recently, people are starting to think about residual inflammatory risk and residual clotting risk. But really what I, uh, my research has focused on understanding the residual environmental risk. And this is after you treat all of the above, what is the, you know, how do we account for environmental risk, spe specifically PM 2.5, but also residual social determinants of health as a residual social risk. Now, uh, I've alluded to one study, but there's actually a lot of studies that really study, investigated the relationship between air pollution and uh, incident diabetes or diabetes risk. And what we see here is this is a collation of all the studies that looked at household air pollution, um, the outdoor air pollution, and secondhand smoking, which is in equivalent terms to uh, uh, air pollution exposure. And you can see the shape of the relationship on the x-axis here. This is the PM 2.5 exposure. 
on the y-axis, we see the relative risk of type 2 diabetes incidence, and the relationship is really not linear. You can see that it's a curvy linear is what we call it, and that's because there's a steep increase in the levels that we experience in the Western world between 0 and 25. And this is where the United States and Canada and Australia live. Um, and you can see that even small changes can actually result in significant increase or reduction of type 2 diabetes risk. Beyond that, what we, we don't fully understand what the impact of uh, really high exposures that you see in New Delhi and Beijing and other areas that are highly polluted. But what, you know, we uh, uh, you know, we think that it's probably a flat, you know, there is no more increase between 100 and 200 and 300 with some caveats because we don't actually have data here. But this shows you this figure is a, is a figure that shows you the number of studies that were done that looked at outdoor air pollution and indoor air pollution as well. When we try to extrapolate this to the world, you see that there is a significant number of patients who uh, experience diabetes due to air pollution. And this includes countries that are not necessarily um, thought of high polluted, highly polluted areas, like in the United States or uh, Mexico. These are not necessarily countries that we have traditionally thought of having a lot of pollution as compared with other countries like India or the Middle East. But you can see on this figure, because of the population, because of the urbanization, we see that the United States actually is not one of the lowest countries that have age standardized attributable risk of diabetes or air pollution, but rather it sits in the middle. And how does that air pollution risk interact with the social um, determinants of health? And this is an area of active um, exploration at this point. This is a study from our own center in Cleveland, Ohio, where the air is really not super polluted, but it's also not very clean. And you can see, as expected, we see that the uh, relationship between PM 2.5 and mortality in people who have diabetes is approximately 200,000 individuals. Um, you can see that the relationship is semi-linear. The higher the air pollution, the higher the risk of mortality. And this is akin to what you see with smoking akin to what you see with high cholesterol and other things. Uh, the risk is approximately 2.5 times. But when you start to overlay that with area deprivation index, which is a metric of uh, social determinants of health, uh, it's a composite metric at the zip code level, you see that there is a relationship is really added. So this figure is a, a representation of how does social deprivation index high being low socioeconomic position and an annual exposure to PM 2.5, it shows you that there is, in, if you are exposed to both high, and when I say high, air pollution is really not super high. This is again in the Western world. Um, and you can see that the hazard ratio is approximately six, means you have six times the risk of mortality compared with the lower exposure. So what can we do? Sorry, as Dr. Akili, just two yes. minutes. Yes, thank you. So what can we do as, as patients and people in general to reduce our impact? This is there is personal mitigation uh, uh, strategies. So uh, home air filtration is one strategy, but also avoiding polluted environments, staying indoors. There are some data about dietary supplements and so on and so forth that can uh, you can read on your own. Uh, I'm going to skip this for the sake of time, but really this is a study that we're doing in a highly polluted country that is relatively high socioeconomic position in Qatar, where we're doing a sham filtration process in, in Qatar to understand the impact of air pollution on metabolic outcomes, including sugar levels and blood pressure, and so on and so forth. So stay tuned for this. Um, and um, this is the CARB project that we are uh, well part of. Uh, and this is it includes seven tasks. But really what we're studying is epidemiology and how can we quantify the cost? How can we quantify the health impact of elevated air pollution using a sophisticated modeling methods to understand the fine scale air pollution throughout California. So we're gonna study the incidence of diabetes or diabetes risk. We're gonna do diabetes emergency department visits and mortality related to diabetes from three different sources and try to compile them into one report. But we also are gonna do very due diligent, um, you know, do our due diligent, very detailed literature review of the relationship
uh, between air pollution and cardiometabolic outcomes, um, understand the air toxic, the more, more monthly mortality, and so on and so forth, and take into account social determinants of health as I mentioned. So thank you so much and uh, looking forward to uh, hearing uh, the other speakers. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Alkindi. Let me share my screen. All right, just uh, before we go to our final speaker for this uh, half of the meeting, I did want to uh, give some reminders to folks in case you might have joined late and missed this, but the uh, slides, ADA compliance slides, will be posted on our website and registrants will receive a notice when they are posted. Uh, as a reminder, we also have a public comment period at the end of the meeting, so if you do have any comments, uh, please save those until the end of the meeting. We will also have an online public comment log that will be open after uh, the meeting and registrants will also receive a notice when this is open for submissions as well. Again, if you have any technical issues during the meeting, you can email Dr. Rash Moheg at the email on the screen there and which I will post into the chat as well. But with that, I will go ahead and introduce our final speaker for this half of the meeting, Dr. Bhavna Shamasunder. She is the Chair and Associate Professor of Enver Urban and Environmental Policy at Occidental College. Dr. Shamasunder teaches and conducts research at the intersection of environmental health and justice with a focus on inequalities in chemical exposures faced by low-income communities and communities of color who live and work in urban and or industrial environments. So Dr. Shemasinder, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, okay, I'm gonna try to share my screen, which says it'll stop you from sharing yours, but. Yes, that's fine. Okay. Um, can everyone see that? Yes, if you can make it full screen. Great. Um, okay, so uh, thank you for everyone's presentations. I. Um, I'm an environmental justice researcher, and so my comments today are going to be really focused on complementing uh, the very specific health work uh, that others have uh, talked about today and really describe what it means um, in communities that are uh, multiply and cumulatively burdened. So there has been work on um, kind of thinking about impacts in communities, um, particularly communities of color, around how do we consider the challenges of living in a place where there's multiple polluting sources um, that are compiled alongside economic, social vulnerabilities. And um, there, um, since the 1980s, really, there have been pioneering efforts to think uh, not linearly or individual pollutant by pollutant, but how do we think about burden that communities face all at the same time together? So um, in the, you know, 20 years ago, Cal Enviro screen um, was uh, started to be established to really think about what, you know, overlapping and cumulative burdens. Um, we were, we created tools um, communities um, fought for and Cal EPA responded and um, tools to sort of visualize where pollution is um, in the state of California. At the federal level, we have um, EJ screen, but really we're trying to understand better how do we understand um, communities' uh, risk from air pollution and other, other things when you have these overlapping burdens. <clears throat> so there's a strong and growing body of research as speakers today have shared um, that demonstrate that disparities in um, air, that there are disparities in air pollution exposures for children and particularly in vulnerable communities of color. Newer research, I think, is informative here um, because we also understand um, something that I think is really important, which is when air quality, air quality is really improving across a lot of the United States over the past decades. But um, disparities are actually growing and communities of color are still systematically really exposed to higher levels of air pollution. And this is um, really at every level, at every income level. And so if you listen to Bob Boulard talk, um, who's kind of the, the founder and father of environmental justice, this is a point that he kind of makes over and over again in that 
we are not we are not seeing sort of the shrinkage of impact in communities of color. And there's a lot of data that supports this um, and why this is, um, I think is, uh, there's a lot written about this, but um, there are historical patterns of things like redlining, uh, infrastructure um, patterns of um, highways that were placed through communities of color in urban renewal, urban planning decisions, um, dis decisions to put highly impacting um, facilities in nearby communities. And so we see this uh, somewhat, you know, this really big challenge um, that we are, um, and it, since it's at every income level, you know, I think um, we, we do see a racialized pattern here. So one of the things that we also know from economists like James Boyce is that uh, pollution, when there is big inequalities in pollution, it really affects everyone. Um, and so the smaller the gap is between the worst polluted and the least polluted, um, the better the air is um, for everyone. So uh, just because it's we have segregation and pollution is worse in some places, it really does mean that everyone's air is worse um, if we're able to tolerate in, it in some places. Um, so the other thing is that we often consider air quality at regional scale. And this is, this is really important differences in air quality, differences in air quality across the region. Um, there's some new studies that have shown um, very mobile monitoring studies that um, were done in the Bay Area that really look at highly localized air pollution um, patterns and show intra-urban disparities. Um, and these studies all really point to a community-centered approach that accounts for um, these very local scales um, and looks for neighborhood features that contribute to higher air pollution and really think about targeting um, constructing targeted interventions. Um, so I'll share some work from our research in South LA. This is this SCLA PUSH um, study in South Central Los Angeles. And um, this is South Central LA. And um, just to the point of uh, disparities, you'll see that um, the quality of air pollution and other environmental benefits really varies across the region. So Santa Monica has hardly any poor air days um, and um, really reported zero in some years. And then as you go inland, um, the number of poor air quality days goes um, increases dramatically. And in some places they face um, really high air pollution burden. So um, SCLA push, um, this report is available online um, and I'm happy to send, share the link, but um, we see that um, PM 2.5 really does have this pattern. Um, and this is from Cal Enviro Screen uh, that we, we see disparities neighborhood to neighborhood. It makes a difference where you live um, if you're exposed to more um, to, to patterns, disparate patterns. So one of the things that we have done in this study is to do local air monitoring. And um, there's an increasing interest in things like low cost sensors where communities can capture their own, given the variability by neighborhood uh, and the variability really block by block, um, would they, um, they can capture their own uh, information. So here is um, uh, data from the Purple Air Monitor that were placed in South LA that we did with communities between May 2019 and May 2020. And you see the worst air really was in January um, through November through February was a worst air that was captured. Um, but this has been really helpful in communities being able to identify. And in this case, they identified um, really specific things like uh, um, automobile um, kind of fixing shops, metal plating facilities, oil and gas um, drilling and um, dry cleaners as a four thing areas of work that they wanted to pursue um, in trying to think about minimizing their pollution. They also went door, um, did a ground truthing effort uh, to think about uh, where, you know, other vulnerabilities, people noted that their trash doesn't get picked up, that when they call to make a complaint, no one responds, um, and that, you know, facing uh, difficult kind of um, issues like, you know, leaving work to go to public comment, communities really don't have some of the access to, um, to information that uh, helps and um, 
kind of combat their their um, challenges. So this project is trying to build a capacity in this community, and it's been you know a multi-year long project, and we do see that communities are more engaged um, when they have a, 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 the ability to engage and understand kind of the very um, the kind of diverse. Um, impacts of air pollution in their in their daily lives. So we saw from the speakers today, and I won't kind of go back over that in the um, interest of really giving us time to talk, but uh, really um, there's a lot of evidence that air pollution is linked with worse in birth outcomes, neurodevelopmental outcomes, and metabolic outcomes, and a whole host of other outcomes. And um, CARB really only quantifies a very few of these currently. So cardiopulmonary mortality, hospitalizations for heart and lung causes, and emergency room visits for asthma. Um, but we know that there's this growing body of likely to be causal, strongly suggestive, and suggestive evidence for endpoints um, discussed here today. So I think really the question is, what do we do about that? How do we make it so we um, recognize things like cumulative burden, and we also um, take the best available science into account. So air pollution we know is more than PM 2.5. Um, we need to think about non-cancer health effects. Um, and uh, these are not included in um, CARBS calculations. I think um, we'd like, you know, I'd like to see them and many of us would like to see um, CARB implementing a broader range of calculations from non-cancer effects. Uh, and um, not assume a threshold for non-cancer effects. Um, this is a slide, um, an image from uh, UCSF um, in the program on reproductive health and the environment that Tracy Woodruff uh, leads. And there was a series of papers that I think are really instructive here that um, help us think about a path forward on um, what we could do to think about including science into risk evaluation and considering real world exposure. So the Cal, Cal EPA can really do this, CARB can do this. So when um, there was an effort to integrate cumulative burden into decision-making, the language also read that there should be guidance on precautionary approaches and including suggestive evidence, um, strongly suggestive evidence is a precautionary approach and um, an area that we haven't actually seen as much movement. And so I think there are um, uh, this series of papers I think gives us some guidance and there are, are other, um, and there are ways, there, there are good how, how do we do this? Um, there's there's um, some instructions for that, that we can, I think, talk about and discuss as a group. So I'm gonna stop there and thank our partners um, with SCLA push um, and, uh, the work that's being done kind of on the ground to capture a lot of the disparities, the very local disparities in air pollution. Um, I'm involved in lots of work in Los Angeles that um, demonstrates that air pollution is very local. So we've done work on oil and gas facilities and found that the closer you live to an oil well, um, 200 meters or closer, your lung function really diminishes um, by by distance. And so I, I think... Um, accounting for these um, very important disparities and the you know big gaps between low-income communities of color and kind of the air in general um, is a, an important thing to consider as kind of we in, include um, additional health endpoints. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen um, here. Thank you. Thank you, Bhavna. Uh, thank you, everyone. To give us a great presentation. We touch upon birth outcome studies and some of the, uh, the pioneering endpoints such as diabetes and new development, especially among children. And also Babna made a good point about the, the more to be done in EPA arena and going forward with the uh, EJ community perspectives. Thank you for additional perspectives on that. So now um, we can start the uh, first panel discussion of the, uh, today's meeting. And first, I'd like to open the floor to the expert panelists if they have any clarifying questions uh, for the presenters. Are there any? Are there any questions? Okay, Tracy. Yes, I first want to thank all the presenters for their excellent talks. And um, I did have a 
want, I had a couple questions. I think but if there was a comment in the first presentation about how risks for air pollution exposure during pregnancy were higher among black women. I wasn't sure if there was, it was Asian women too. And he talked about numerically was like twice as much, 50% more. I really think it's important to be able to add because the issue with the carb and we're doing around these quantification is to really better act more accurately capture the true risks to the populations that may not be currently revealed. Thank you for that question. Actually, I didn't focus so much on quantifying the uh, associations in this presentation, but yes, we did find some disparities by um, Black, Asian, as well as Hispanic. Um, that's how it's coded in the um, data set. Um, and it's really, um, you know, some of it's socioeconomic status, some of it's just differences um, in healthcare. And then as uh, we pointed out in the presentations, the environmental exposures themselves, um, PM are, are different in uh, different areas. But um, yeah, in some studies, it's twice as much. In some studies, it's three times as much. And, and it really kind of depends, um, but it is um, significantly different. And that's the most important finding is that it is, um, you know, there are some overlapping confidence intervals, but they are different enough that um, it raises kind of this red flag. Also, the fact that we find consistency in the differences is really important. It's not just one study that's showing this, it's, a, it's many studies. So um, yeah, thanks for pointing that out. Thank you. Tracy and Rupan, any other questions from panelists? to the presenters. I have a question for, for Bhavna. Um, I, I, really liked, uh, I really liked your presentation and sort of the, the work that you're doing to engage communities. And I, 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 wonder if, um, I wonder if you could comment on how that translates to, to action on the part of the communities. Uh, you know, when they when they get in, engaged, then then are they you know are they more likely to are they more likely to uh, to speak out at public meetings or to engage with the press uh, or other activities that really lead to change. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, we've found that there is like the technicalities of air pollution meetings can be mind numbingly boring for communities. And so, and they also, they arrive and they're, you know, it's a long wait. And so I think, but to, so what we do is we do kind of a, a air pollution training with them. And then if there's a public comment meeting, we um we're, we have we do some sort of front end education around kind of what the comments about but i think um understanding that uh their air quality can change is i think powerful in some ways in and of itself and if they engage that they and they make complaints um and that these things could be meaningful is helpful um it's not perfect I do think that uh, there are the problems of um, building capacity. Hi, I'm Siri. Choose the voice you'd like me to use. You can. Is that mine? Oh, is that... <laughs> Somebody Siri went off. Um, but I think that you know these uh, low cost sensors are super com more more and more commonly used, and um, also these purple air monitors. But the agencies don't account for them um, as kind of a meaningful metric of regulatory. Um, kind of, it's not a monitor that they. Um, take the data from and, you know, take action. So I think I'm being really clear with communities that uh, that just because they know more and they're measuring their error, it's not necessarily going to lead to change. That balance is a hard one, but I do think they do participate more. Um, communities that are organized and participate in these trainings do come to meetings more, are active in, on the board, you know, in board meetings, and also come um, just complain, learn how to complain sometimes. Thank you. And Mike? I, well, I want to thank all the presenters for really insightful and interesting talks. Great to see the state of the art um, summarized 
uh, I guess, you know, when, when we look at vulnerable populations, different species of particles, different air pollution constituents, we're in a bit of a conundrum because we have, we have ample evidence that there is a difference in effects by air pollution mixture. Um, we have evidence that some subgroups are likely to be more susceptible. But if we're going to do health impact assessment, we have to, we have to in some way quantify that dose response. And you know, I think what's what's been happening, and this is no fault of Air Resources Board or anyone else that does health impact assessment, but sort of in the absence of that definitive evidence, we just don't quantify the effects. And I wonder if we need to shift our thinking, and this is for all panelists, towards something that's closer to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, where they do expert consensus on the level of certainty, you know, so heat impacts um, caused by climate change, very high certainty, high potential for effects within the next 10 years are already happening. And then, you know, go down the list so that we might end up with assessments that say, well, here's here's where we're very certain, here's, you know, so that we come up with that framework so that we don't ignore the evidence that's there, but that at the same time, we give people that are decision makers and the public some level of, of assessment on where the certainty is in those, those estimates. And, you know, I think it's particularly important for the different constituents, because when we look at, say, wildfires, we see effects uh, acute. We don't have any really good long-term studies. But if we look at long-term contributions of, to PM on the annual average, they're typically, you know, less than two micrograms and often very small. Or if we look at break and tire wear particles like barium, um, we're we're really, you know, down to nanograms, not micrograms. So if we just look at the mass, it's not going to tell us much, but we need to think of ways to, to uh, convey that level of certainty and then give the whole range of potential effects, I think. That's just my opinion, but um, I, I'm interested in hearing what the panelists uh, think of that. Thank you, Mike. I think it's a good segue to actually to lead into our discussion. So may, can you share the screen? So actually we have a list of possible discussion topic among panelists and speakers at this point. And sure. It looks like Tracy had her hand up though before. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks. And I um, do think this is a good segue. I think the, just let me just put a, a, a uh, mother frame on that because one of the things that's in the kind of discussion points that we have been talking about is how do we prioritize health endpoints and new approaches to health analysis. But I think the kind of larger frame, which was brought up and we, um, I think is a really important point is that we should be valuing health effects that have some information, even though the information may be different levels of certainty. And while I know you mentioned the intergovernmental panel, I mean, EPA already provides a kind of strength of evidence um, summary for the different health outcomes. You know, I don't know that we necessarily agree with all of them, but they can be a basis for, as I think Bobna was saying, is you could quantify all the health effects that are suggestive or above. And that that kind of frame would be an appropriate approach that CARB could take that would meet both the um, role of the precautionary principle, which was, um, I think Bob also pointed out as part of the, um, one of the guiding principles for these analyses, or I can't remember actually which regulatory standard that was, but that they specifically mentioned the precautionary principle and it would also um, serve the environmental justice uh, mandates for the state of California to make sure that you are valuing all health endpoints that could have some influence on health outcomes at a community level, because if you don't value them, then you necessarily assume they're zero, which we know that's not true from the excellent presentations that were here today. And I think the next panel will talk a little bit about how to 
uh, account for some of the uncertainty, but I do think that that underlying principle is, a, is something that would be useful for the state to consider. So I'm, um, I think believe I am charged with organizing our discussion on this, is that right? So um, here's some of the topics, here are the topics that we've identified. Um, of course, panel members like Mike may bring up some other um, thoughts from the presentation. So I see that Irva has her hand raised. So I will um, go to you first. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I'm, I, I was really struck, and again, I, I just want to say, reiterate what other people said. Those were really great presentations and covered, um, you know, some of the really key areas. Um, there, there, are, you know, there's lots to say. My own work in neurodevelopment, um, uh, I think it's an impressive body of research. It's there's still, you know, I think some puzzlement about um, the European studies and. Um, I, I actually think some of that may might be <clears throat> related to a uh, in, in Europe where the center of the cities is often um, populated by um, the more wealthier people, which tends not to be the case in the United States. So there's um, there's kind of this mix in which the um, the social factors actually may end up being sort of masking uh, some, and, and those are that area being the most polluted in in general. So uh, there might be some sort of masking that's going on in 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 the European studies. Um, and, and I also just wanted to add to um, what uh, Stephanie was saying about the blood-brain barrier, um, which, just to be really specific. Um, it's 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 really you know it, in other words the leakiness is not a pathology it's actually what development is about and the the blood brain barrier is it, there's hardly any of it by birth and it really takes up until about two years of age be, before it's you know pretty much fully functional um, and and that's a that's a really key part about the, the this vulnerable time period. Um, for it, which includes obviously the prenatal period as well, um, and then and then a comment about the the um, metabolic and cardiovascular endpoints, which um, you know is a newer literature, obviously than than respiratory, for example, but um, not so much the cardio cardio cardiopulmonary has sort of been 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 studied a lot with. Um, you know, interesting work around, you know, heart rate and, and all sorts of things, heart rate variability and such. And, um, uh, but I also wanted to point out that many of those metabolic outcomes are also really closely related to um, immunologic uh, mechanisms that uh, are, it, it doesn't actually appear in the list of, of outcomes that, um, that we saw earlier um, in, the, in the introduction, I think. Uh, but, but I think it, it, it actually is is a is a key um, a key area in terms of inflammation um, that has wide effects on many of the other outcomes. Um, and then the last comment I want to make is about the the vulnerable populations and um, uh, communities of color uh, and what you know has has been in you know the reproductive field for example of black women having uh, higher low birth weight babies um, at about double the rate in in general and really pretty much every study that's ever looked at that and um but taking on the the this lens of well, what are the factors in those communities? Um, that this the assumption has been that this is biological, um, or I don't know the assumption, but kind of the conclusion that you know, looking at diet and looking at I, I don't know, not not necessarily diet, but the factors that have been looked at, you know, haven't explained it, um, but the larger environment um, 
you know, really clearly has to play some role. Uh, and really trying to pin that down as in terms of <clears throat> uh, uh, to, to the extent that attribution can be done, but attribution in, in the context of multiple exposures and synergistic impacts um, of, of the social factors and the environmental factors with air pollution being a, a, a really high one um, in virtually every city um, that I know of. So um, congratulations on really great presentation. I think it provides us with, with a good framing of really trying to address these, these, uh, these high, high, um, these questions that, that, the, that um, the agency needs to have uh, answered for how to, uh, how to move forward. But I think this is really compared to where we've been for the last, you know, five years, I think that, that, uh, um that this is really the right thing to do all right great thanks i think uh we've heard from several of our panel members but not jenny so i was just going to call on you jenny i know that uh, perhaps you want to give a few thoughts as in relationship to these uh what we just heard perhaps focus on some of the topics Hi, um, I just want to echo everyone else's thanks to the speakers. It was really, I know, hard to cram all of your research into such a short presentation, but I appreciated um, your presentations very much. And I guess my comments um, and questions for the speakers kind of focus around both the first and the last bullet points. So kind of the prioritization of health endpoints, as well as how to move forward with something that might be strongly suggestive, uh, not causal. And they kind of have to do with burdens on the communities. So it seemed like I heard from Dr. Alakindi some strong evidence suggesting that a smaller spatial scale of the estimating impacts would be very beneficial in looking at impacts on communities very close to sources or experiencing very high pollution. Um, and I think that's something perhaps might be echoed by other panelists. And another area is um, really the burden on communities and how to prioritize. And I think that we also heard from Dr. Alkindi about the effects on type two diabetes, um, exacerbation or initiation. Um, potentially from the particulate air pollution. So um, that is something certainly a risk factor that might be more prevalent in certain communities um, of color. And um, but I guess my question is really, since we're looking at economic analyses, um, or, or I'm kind of interested to hear from um, Dr. Baum and others, um, clinicians especially, like the effects, the costs that are on and burdens on the communities that are felt by some of these diseases. Uh, Dr. Holm, um, I believe you're a clinician, right? Um, so, so preterm birth, I think of you know obvious costs in the NICU. You know, having had a kid there myself, but I was wondering if you could comment on costs perhaps they go on after that period or are or, or burdens to the families uh, and the communities and other other birth outcomes um, effects. Because I think that that it's my understanding those are not currently captured by the current system. Um, and any any panelists or would care to comment uh, um, on these thoughts, please do. I don't currently have an active clinic, but I am an MD. <clears throat> um, yeah, I mean, you know, all of these things that we've been talking about can have huge effects for families. And, you know, the combo of neurodevelopmental effects and birth outcome effects and metabolic effects, right? That that whole trifecta, um, as well as all of the other ones that we also uh, have plenty of evidence for, um, can really change a kid's life right? It can, you know, if you uh, 
are more obese <clears throat> and have a learning disability and you know these these things can really affect the way that kids are able to learn and um and and function in, in society and so these are hugely important things that i don't think we are capturing well and I, you know i think multiple people have mentioned uh the precautionary principle and it, you know i think it's hugely important to make sure that we're protecting our our i'll say kids because that's as a pediatrician that's that's my particular uh lens um but from everything we possibly can right be as health protective as possible um i said to uh someone recently you know, if we know that there are health effects from something, why do we have to wait to figure out exactly how bad, right? Like we don't need to keep researching to figure out how bad before we take action. And I, I think that's really critical. Thanks, that's a, a great, I wanted to just bring up some threads that have been coming up. So um, first of all, I wanna thank Bobna because um, she did share that that precautionary principle document is from 2004. So this is a good time, you know, it's not quite 20 years, but it's a good time to um, think about how to implement that within the frame that has been brought up by Mike and myself and the other panelists about quantifying health effects that are have some evidence. I just wanted to pick up on uh, something else about, because we touched lightly on the fact that different populations have higher responses to these um, exposures. And I know one of the other components of this is to better account for the cumulative impacts in communities. And so I'm wondering if we could um, get some thoughts maybe from the panelists or from the speakers about, um, I, we, we heard a the discussion about that black pregnant mothers have a higher risk for adverse birth outcomes, maybe the other panelists could touch on what they see in terms of how to account for these more um, higher risks for these populations that are in a way that can be implemented by CARB, if anyone has any thoughts about that. I think maybe Dr. Alkindi, you talked about the um, social, was it the social deprivation index, I think? And maybe you could comment on that. And the other thing I wanted to just note also in your presentation, which I thought was really useful, and I think probably is a thread too, is that the, the um, dose response is steeper at the lower exposures. And I think we see this for many other types of environmental pollutants. Lead is also another example of that. Um, I think we see that for the other health effects related to um, air pollution and think that is also a really important component when we're thinking about accurately accounting for the higher exposures in these uh, more impacted communities. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, there are two things that are somewhat intertwined and used by the lay, uh, you know, by the public uh, interchangeably. But these concepts are this concept of susceptibility and vulnerability, right? And you know, and they are, although they have similar meaning, but in reality, one means that we, the communities that are socially deprived, and I'm trying to stay away from race because race is a, is a, is a social construct uh, at the end. Uh, but when you talk about communities, uh, socially vulnerable communities or poor communities or communities who live at lower socioeconomic positions, they experience two things. And this is what we see mostly from the cardiac literature, from looking at cardiac outcomes and cardiac mortality, we see two things. One is that they're actually exposed to higher levels, right? The second thing that uh, for each point increase, let's say one microgram per meter cube increase in PM exposure, and, and this is, I'm talking about the long-term exposure, they experience a higher relative increase in, in events. So the, these are complex because when you add them together, the impact becomes humongous when, when we talk about environmental justice and environmental disparities. I believe that uh, the other speakers and panelists may have you know, similar or maybe different opinions about this when it comes to different outcomes. But when we talk about cardiac and metabolic outcomes, uh, we see that these two actually result in 
a composite and add to that the impact of other pollutants, right? Which we haven't talked about a lot, but you know, you look at everything, noise pollution, light pollution, everything else um, that impacts communities that are socially vulnerable way higher. And it results in probably a higher impact for each point increase. So I think there needs to be a more comprehensive uh, assessment of the environment uh, or what we call the exposome to understand really how do these interact with each other. And I think this is what's missing in the literature for the most part. There are studies that started to look into say, you know, two pollutant or three pollutant or multi pollutant at times, but still these are limited. And with the evolution of data science approaches and machine learning and artificial intelligence, I think this becomes more, um, uh, you know, important and central to our understanding of how do these pollutants work with each other to impact health outcomes. Great, that was excellent. Thank you. I have Michael, Irva, and then Rob. Yeah, thanks. Um, I just wanted to put a rejoinder on what uh, Jenny uh, Quintana and Stephanie Holmes said about the economic impacts. And, you know, quantitatively, it's always mortality that dominates. Um, it's usually on the order of 95% of the total economic costs of the exposures. And part of that is because the economists are very good at, at valuing uh, statistical life, although I would note that there are huge differences between jurisdictions and continents. So it's about 8.7 million US dollars and about two point uh, in, in the US and about 2.4 million euros. So say $2.5 million in the, U, uh, in the European Union. So there are big differences there. But regardless, it's always going to be mortality. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't be valuing these other outcomes and trying to quantify them. And I think what uh, Stephanie said is a critical point that, um, you know, if what, what are the impacts that have this potential to morph into developmental problems for children or chronic disease for adults? And those are really, you know, when we look at the health burden, the chronic effects are often on the order of 10 times greater than the acute ones. So that might be something, but, you know, I think it's a, it's a decision that has to be made at the state level, is how much you want to value these things that are inherently, we're not very good at valuing in economics or they are going to have a lower value, but it might be something that's very long term and important for the, the person that's suffering with those conditions or diseases. And then I just wanted to quickly comment on the super linear curves and how I think we have to be really cautious about the studies that combine very disparate types of exposure like ambient air pollution, indoor um, biomass burning and you know cigarette active cigarette smoking toxicologically they're very different and I worked with Rick Burnett and Arden Pope who were really the leaders in developing the first super linear curve for PM and then Rick did an amazing study that was published I think in 2018 that I was also part of and in that study we actually started to incorporate some of the high dose response functions from India and China and instead of being super linear, it was a linear curve for all cause mortality. And that meant that, you know, the estimates went from about 4.5 million excess deaths a year to 9 million. Um, so it may be that we're seeing this super linear curve because we're trying to do too much with our statistics and we don't have the information to inform them. If we actually had the information from those high ends, it might, might well show that they're not super linear which has implications for environmental justice communities um, and how we treat these very higher high-end exposures. All right, thank you. I, just before we go to Irva, I just wanted to note that um, we'll have conversation about valuation in the next panel. And I know that we have some experts who are gonna tell us that we need 
more priorities to do better valuation because we're probably underestimating a lot of them. But EPA did, in their drinking water standard, provide valuation for uh, on the PFAS standard for low birth weight. And in part, that value is based on the fact that increased low birth weight in increases the risk of infant mortality. So a lot of the out health outcomes we're talking about do link to mortality, either short term or long term. So um, that's something really important as part of this uh, as CARB looks to improve their quantification approaches. Uh, Irva and then Rob. Yeah. Uh... So, what you know, one of the questions you know that's being raised here is, um, you know, how do we evaluate? How do we prioritize, and so forth? And I think that um, the concept of you know taking the most vulnerable and uh, aiming, regulating to protect the most vulnerable um, has been part of you know the California regulatory sort of doctrine at certain points in time. Uh, and it's also somewhat related to what the toxicologists do, which is to put in, you know, this tenfold extra uh, factor for variability within the populations uh, in, in that regulatory framework. So I, I think that's a, a concept that we ought to elevate in in this discussion um that said uh i i just want to warn around the regulation around air pollution with regard to the standards that are being set in light of um the the real solutions for the mega fires in california and the real solutions have to involve prescribed burns and cultural burns in order to avoid the mega fires that bring us pollution with you know air quality indices um, of you know 300 uh, often for uh, several weeks at a time in many of our communities so um, those high exposures and and the short term, you know, we've seen evidence and it's been presented right here today that um, short term high exposures can be uh, very devastating um, with a lot of um, immediate impacts and long term impacts. Um, and and so in you know, for instance, in the the, the current uh, proposed ruling in, by EPA on on PM two point five, really, you know, we need to have exceptions for um, prescribed burns because otherwise, uh, we have way more devastation, way more um, health uh, impacts uh, down the line, and. Um, so it, it, it's a it's a trick it's a tricky subject, but the evidence is pretty overwhelming that the smaller uh, prescribed burns actually prevent um, much more devastation. Much uh, they they pre they actually do prevent um, the the really extreme um, fires and the intensity of the exposures of the smoke exposures coming from those fires, um, which some some evidence does suggest that composition wise, it's more toxic than than trap. So um, I, th I think that's really important to keep in mind. Um, and, and then, you know, one of the other issues about the localized foci for interventions, which I think is really important, um, understanding smaller area communities that really are being intensely exposed. Um, and, it, you know, because pollution <laughs> spreads very, very easily, um, but does drop off um, from sources, uh, it, it, that's more of a challenge. And it may be that in a lot of those cases, uh, providing households with ways in which they can really improve their indoor air. It doesn't solve the problem of people who work outdoors or children who, you know, more or less need to have some outdoor time. Um, uh, but, you know, some of these really, really effective but inexpensive interventions like, um, you know, the, the indoor box fans um, that, uh, that, are, that are really spreading um, uh, in their usage. 
it could be really important. And um, uh, and then just one thing about the the. Um, so, Irva, I just want to. I'll make stop. I, I was going to say something about the super linear, but I'll stop there. Enough. Okay, point. great. Because I know that Rob's has his hand up, and we haven't had a chance to hear from him. So I um, just want to make sure because I'm noting that we'll have to take a break before we uh, um, go to the next exciting panel, Rob. You have your mute button on. One of the things that impressed me about the presentations today is how how what how how they you know the formal assessment by EPA lags behind the evolving evidence. And I think, yeah, we saw. I thought quite persuasive evidence that air pollution causes low birth weight, metabolic disease, and neurodevelopmental may not be quite as strong, but uh, uh, strong evidence is, as well. And I think, you know, historically, if we if we look back, you know, many of the many of the outcomes that we that we assess that we calculate a burden of disease for now um, are, yeah, you know, we're not, we didn't do it 10 years ago. And the, we also find that for, even for the outcomes that we have been looking at for a long time, that we see uh, effects at lower levels and that we see an increasing burden even as levels fall, and you know, CARB's done a wonderful job over the last forty years of reducing levels of uh, of uh, particulate exposure to the to the popu population. But we still see that the burden, you know, the burden itself does not really fall because we're learning more about these exposures. And I, I, I yeah, I mentioned this because, you know, we we think of ourselves as being very conservative. Uh, but in fact, in the context of the precautionary principle, the sort of the 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 caution that we that we have in in looking at burdens of outcome burdens of associations that are less certain, um, I think you know the precautionary principle suggests that that in fact we've been not so conservative, but reckless in the past, and maybe continue to be. Um, so I think yeah, you know, we're going to talk more more uh, later in the morning about about um, health impact assessment. Uh, but I think these this sort of historical perspective of how how the burden of disease has been going up over time is worth keeping in mind when we when we get to that discussion. All right. Well, thank you, Rob. And um, this, I think that was a great conclusion to our panel discussion, as well as the presentations. And I'm going to turn it back over to Carve. Thank you, Tracy, and everyone, panelists and speakers, to actively participate in the discussion. We are really excited having your inputs going forward to improve and update our um, analysis methodology going forward. I really appreciate your input. And now we are going to have a long waited 10 minute break. So now it's time 10.55 Pacific time. So please come back, uh, return at 11.05 Pacific and oh, wait a minute. Yes, and then 11.05 Pacific time and 2.05 Eastern time PM. So see you shortly in 10 minutes. Thank you everyone again. Okay, it's 11.05 uh, Pacific time. So I just wanted to welcome back folks from the 10 minute break and we'll go ahead and get started with the uh, next set of presentations. <laughs> 
So the next set of presentations will be on approaches for health benefit valuation. And I do want to remind folks that if you are wanting to provide public comment, we will have a public comment period in about an hour from now. So just to just as a reminder for that, if you do want to provide public comment, we will have instructions to do so at the end, but you'll just raise your hand and we'll, we will call on you during the public comment period. All right, so for this uh, set of presentations, here are our presenters for today. Our first speaker for this section will be Dr. Pete Maniloff. He is an economist with the USCPA Office of Air Quality Planning and Standards. Dr. Maniloff is an environmental economist at the USCPA. He works to improve how the agency values changes in air quality. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Maniloff. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, so you know, the standard disclaimer that what I say is my own opinion and not the opinion of the US EPA or its policies. Uh, I'd like to comment on three points. So first, how we the US EPA decides what health outcomes to value for changes in air quality. Second, how we currently do that. And third, some recent advances in economics that we're considering. So I should note uh, two things. One is that uh, you know, I work with the BINMAP tool and the BINMAP team. Uh, we currently have a SAB, a scientific advisory board committee, considering the BINMAP tool and considering our methods and the, considering the latest implementation of the tool. And so some of what you're about to hear may change uh, depending on the uh, advice they give us and our response. And I should also note that you know other organizations value other channels and outcomes such as the impacts of climate change. So how do we decide what to value? First of all, the EPA conducts periodic scientific reviews typically called uh, integrated science assessments. So these examine the literature and provide an assessment of the scientific literature on whether health endpoints are caused by air pollution. Uh, these consider categories of endpoints, such as respiratory effects and specific pollutants, such as ozone or PM2.5. And if the ISA assesses the linkage between one of those pollutants and a category as causal or likely causal, then we try to quantify the impacts of specific endpoints in that category. If we assess that there's a plausible biological linkage between a specific endpoint, such as asthma onset, and that pollutant, then we try to quantify and value that specific endpoint. So we generally focus on clinical outcomes, uh, those that can be linked to specific ICD codes, and not subclinical outcomes. This is in part due to data limitations, um, both the data in the traditional sense of incidence data, but also data in the sense of scientific uh, data, sci uh, scientific results. So we select the best possible, best available concentration response functions for each pollutant endpoint pair from among the scientific papers in the ISA. We have a variety of criteria. Uh, these are fairly intuitive. They're things like that the study setting be comparable to the US population and population and air quality distributions, that the study provides the parameters that we need. And then we have preferences for things like uh, longer term studies and studies that use exposure estimates relying on multiple approaches and so on. So this is documented in a recent technical support document titled Estimating PM and Ozone Attributable Health Benefits. That's available on the BINMAP website and it was released in January. I'm going to share a table from that uh, document and talk through it briefly. So this is the health endpoints we currently value for our prime main benefits analyses for PM 2.5 changes. So I want to walk through and note a few things. So first you see on the left the endpoint groups, such as mortality or respiratory effects or cardiovascular effects. We see specific endpoints, such as stroke or asthma onset. Exposures can be long-term or short-term. So this is not a high and low end in the sense of a scenario analysis. This is considering short-term exposures and long-term exposures. And then we have different age groups. Um, this typically describes estimates for different age groups from the available scientific literature. 
And so we combine these, uh, you know, we, we sum these uh, in, I would say, thoughtful ways, uh, trying to get as much coverage as we can with, you know, strong scientific grounding, but not avoiding double counting. So, for example, for mortality, we, we would consider infant mortality, and we would also use one of several different estimates of adult mortality. And we would sum those to get a total mortality. But there's a hole here. We're missing non-infant minor mortality. And that's just due to a current uh, lack of available estimates. Okay. I'm going to end that share. Okay. So once we've settled on that list of endpoints, how do we actually value them? How do we come up with dollar figures? So we find a concentration response function. That's a, you know, really a parameter that relates the change in the level of air quality to a uh, change in the percentage of uh, outcomes, counts of outcomes, number of deaths or asthma cases or school loss days. And so we use those to get a percentage change. We multiply that by baseline incidents, the baseline number of people who would develop the outcome, and that gives us a change in the number of events. So this baseline incidence data comes from different sources for each endpoint. Uh, it comes from CDC Wonder for the mortality data, it comes from HCOP uh, when available, and then a variety of other data sources, also documented in that same technical support document. Um, Often we are able to use data from other government agencies, but not always. So at this point, we have a change in the number of cases. And so we can multiply that by an average benefit to avoiding each case for each outcome. So ideally, this is an economic utility measurement, or what economists would call a welfare measurement, such as the value of a statistical life. So this is often called a willingness to pay measure, or willingness to pay approach, and it describes how much people want to avoid us avoiding a small risk of some outcome. So avoiding a small risk of a heart attack or avoiding a small risk of death. It includes medical expenditures with some asterisks, um, but it also includes impacts that wouldn't show up in household bills, like the unhappiness induced by having a condition if that's relevant for that condition. These are measures are then converted and denominated in dollar terms. So that's just a unit from the standpoint of economics, but uh, this means that we can use these measures in cost benefit analysis. So that's the best case scenario and a common one. But for some endpoints that we value, we aren't aware of recent estimates of willingness to pay, of economic utility um, to avoiding those impacts. In those cases, we use measures of the cost of illness. So intuitively, this is the medical cost of treating that outcome. Uh, so for example, for acute myocardial infarctions, we use a cost of illness measure. And this includes a direct cost of medical care, so not the charges, but what's actually the cost incurred by the medical team. It can also include costs such as lost work, but it will exclude unhappiness induced by having a heart attack, um, either acute physical pain or uh, lost uh, if there are activities one cannot do subsequently, sort of disappointment, not being able to do those activities. Those would not be captured by a cost of illness measure but they are you know, real cost of these events. We draw these estimates of willingness to pay and cost of illness from the peer reviewed literature. Uh, sometimes this is sort of medical journals, sometimes this is economics journals, it's from wherever we can find them. They're published in an array of places. And we have a uh, set of selection for evaluation of selection criteria for these studies uh, they are again fairly intuitive uh, so they we prefer that they match the icd codes that are used in the epi studies that we're drawing from we prefer that they match the epi studies age range we prefer more recent studies and so on these criteria also are in the technical support document and uh, then we update them 
or inflation and we do discounting and we deal with changes in income in technically appropriate ways. So once we've done this for each endpoint, we're, we're typically doing this for many years into the future. So we sum the dollar denominated benefits to or costs uh, of changes in air quality in each year. And then we discount that back to the present and sum those all up. And that gets us an estimate of the total benefits of the, uh, the total health benefits of a change in air quality or a total costs. Okay, let me turn to my third point. I want to comment on some recent uh, advances in economics, uh, two in particular. The first is thinking about human behavioral responses to air pollution. And the second is thinking about subclinical impacts of air pollution. So human behavioral responses. So adaptation, averting behavior, defensive expenditures, related terms. So concretely, people do things like uh, respond to air quality by putting off outdoor recreation. They might not go to the zoo that day if there's an alert. They buy over-the-counter medications. In some settings, they buy air filters. Uh, things like this. Those are all costly. We don't currently value these impacts, although there is evidence that they're non-trivial. So if one study found that the Knox budget program reduced pharmaceutical expenditures by about a billion dollars per year. So that's more than a tenth of the mortality damages estimated in that same study. There are a couple challenges here. So one is double counting. So if we include a willingness to pay estimate for some outcome and avoiding that outcome is part of why people were buying the pharmaceuticals and we also include the buying the pharmaceuticals, then we're double counting benefits and we want to avoid that. Another challenge is a tension between symptom-based valuation and endpoint-based valuation. So we primarily use and have discussed endpoint-based valuation, thinking of valuing specific health endpoints. But if we think of an improvement in air quality that reduces cases of two different health endpoints, which would each lead to headaches, and then people also buy less headache medication, which endpoint should we attribute that change in spending to? Um, we wouldn't want to do both, right? Another challenge is that these averting behaviors may be changing, particularly with the introduction of new information technologies. Uh, earlier, someone mentioned purple air monitors, right? air quality model monitoring more broadly, air quality alerts, um, things like the air now system. We have you know, much better data and much better information technologies for people to get access to that data than we used to. Um, but the epidemiological studies that we rely on sort of implicitly include and rely on uh, estimates of the averting behavior in the study setting at the time the study was done. But if that averting behavior pattern changes, then the relationship between ambient air quality and health outcomes may change. So if, if averting behavior patterns have changed since the uh, study was done, or if they change in the future due to new uh, developments in communications or responses to air quality, then um, that might change our concentration response functions. The final advance I want to touch on is the recent literature on subclinical effects of air pollution. Uh, so there's a wide array of evidence from a variety of fields that air pollution can impair cognitive function, reduce happiness, increase anxiety, reduce pro-social behavior, increase aggressive behavior. That combination seems to lead to more crime, impairs physical performance, et cetera. There's a long list. Um, this is daunting to monetize, right? One straightforwardly, conceptually, relatively straightforwardly monetizable impact might be the workplace productivity impacts. So there's evidence that air pollution reduces both labor hours worked and reduces productivity during labor hours while working. And so there's an array of evidence from different contexts, um, but we kind of have, we, mo we can group labor productivity studies mostly into two categories. So the first category of studies use microdata uh, to compare individual worker studies, uh, to compare individual worker production with measures of air pollution. 
So these often focus on a single firm or on a single work setting. This is largely due to data availability. This also has the advantage of, uh, for the statistics of providing fairly homogenous tasks. So examples include agricultural work, call centers, manufacturing, computer programmers, uh, professional athletes, baseball umpires. Baseball umpires seem to miss more balls and strike calls when PM is high. So those are the microdata studies. Sorry, Dr. This... Merlov, just a couple minutes. Great, thanks. Um, the second group of studies use an economy-wide approach. So typically they do something like a uh, statistical approach. Often they use an instrumental variables approach. They regress county year GDP on measures of air quality. And then they find some effect. So we have the bottom up estimates, the top down estimates. Both sets of studies typically find something like a one microgram per cubic meter increase in PM2.5 causes a reduction in production by something on the order of tenths of a percent. So tenths of a percent is sounds small, right? It's, it's tenths of a percent. Um, it may be. Um, it may be large. If the US economy is a very large entity, uh, tenths of a percent of that is a large number. Um, so I'd say the quantitative impact is not clear at this point. Um, a group of us at EPA are uh, working on how we might value that. Um, this is a research project, no, not a regulatory project, uh, but we're thinking this would involve a whole economy analysis as we're talking about sector-wide impacts, then large, potentially large impacts that might spill over across sectors. Um, it's easy to think of how BINMAP could be used to estimate changes in productivity that could be fed into an economy-wide model. but. No, it's easy to think of things. This is a ongoing research effort. So with that, I'd like to wrap up. Uh, take it away, May or Al. Thank you so much, Dr. Manoff. That was great. Our uh, final speaker for today is Dr. Al McGartland. Let me share my screen. Dr. McGartland is the director of the National Center for Environmental Economics at USCPA. In his position at the EPA, Dr. McGartland advises senior leadership on regulatory analyses, science and environmental policy, while leading assessments on the benefits and cost effectiveness of various environmental programs. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. McGartland. Thanks so much. I'm gonna share my screen, I think, right? Yes. <laughs> Can you see it? Not yet. Hmm. Not yet. No. No. But if you're not able to, uh, Share it. I can. I also have your slides as well. Yeah. Why don't you do it then? That sure. way I can see the folks. Thanks. Appreciate it. I'll okay. stop sharing. Good. All right. I'll just stay next slide when I'm ready to go. Uh, great. So what I'm going to talk about today, and I'm glad uh, some of this was already covered in the last part because there's, you know, with limited time, I don't know that I can get to all this. I could easily spend an hour on each of these topics. Uh, my first, and these are the first three, I think are the most important from my perspective that, um, and things I've been, we've been thinking about. The first is when we do quantify health benefits, we have a problem in benefit cost analysis and it's what we lovingly call the all in or all out problem. And we'll get to that. The next, uh, we get just the previous presentation just talks a little bit about this, but sort of willingness to pay or cost of illness concept of how to value benefits. Um, and sometimes it's usually viewed as a willingness to pay or cost of illness. And sometimes I think it's more appropriate to say willingness to pay and cost of illness in the sense that they're additive. Uh, third on my list is the capturing non-cancer health endpoints and, and a benefit cost analysis. Now, I wanna be clear, I don't, you know, benefit cost analysis is only one input in the decision-making process previous discussion, which was very uh, interesting, talked about environmental justice and other effects. All those things belong in decision-making. 
but for benefit cost analysis, the, the goal really is to capture uh, a, and quantify and value all the benefits of a, of a given policy option and, and have that inform the decision-making process as is with an EJ analysis or other kinds of analysis as well. And so um, I'm, not, I'm definitely not saying that benefit cost analysis makes a decision for a decision maker, but it definitely can be one input into many. And then last but not least on my list are sort of some additional benefits that sometimes get uh, not enough attention or get no attention. Some were already just mentioned, the labor productivity and cognitive impacts. Um, there's a third on my list, which is how respiratory disease um, morbidity can be uh, exacerbated by air pollution, including COVID. And last but not least, something called altruism. So we may have a benefit when we improve the air quality of those who are in sort of um, in EJ communities or those with disproportionate risk. Sorry, next slide. So this is the all or all in or all out problem. So uh, a previous discussion did talk nicely about the current approach. And so you could have um, studies or categories of health effects that are suggestive, for example, but we don't quantify them. Uh, I think in most places probably don't quantify them. And so they count basically as a zero in, the, in a benefit cost analysis because they're not quantified and hence they're not valued either. And then once we get the sort of uh, impacts or health endpoints that are likely to be causal, then we begin to quantify them. And even then it's only if we can find as uh, was just described as the what's, if we can find a, a particular dose response for it or if it's causal. And so this line represents the fact that it's zero up until the point where we get to likely to be causal. But that's really missing the boat in some conceptual sense, because again, we're supposed to be bringing uh, a picture to the decision maker of all the benefits of the cost. So if, um, if, if you were in a neighborhood and two of your neighbors got food poisoning and they ate at a nearby local restaurant, you'd probably avoid that local restaurant, at least until they discovered the cause. And so even though we're not saying that they definitely got food poisoning from that restaurant, there's still a benefit, it seems to me, from avoiding that restaurant. And similarly, just because we think it's suggestive, there's still a, a very real benefit. And frankly, the more frank the health endpoint is, the bigger the benefit is. Oh, next slide. So, we talk about you know how we value impacts and sort of willingness to pay for environmental improvements, and you know we in our own lives we deal with uncertainty all the time, right? Most of us, or maybe all of us, buy insurance for all kinds of uncertain outcomes because we want to mitigate the cost. And so uh, this is um, this kind of thinking can be applied here as well. So just because it's suggestive, it's still a really real willingness to pay to avoid those health, health outcomes. Um, and fun, I'll note actually with the um, really big advances in causal inference that are happening in biostatistics and in my field of econometrics, uh, we can have much higher empirical confidence on the causality anyway. And so in some sense, the institutions which make these determinations for causal or likely causal are sort of lagging behind really what where the literature is. And I get why they do that, because they wait and evaluate the entire body of evidence. But again, um, the empirical literature is often way out in front. And so it was already described that we only do causal and likely causal. I think it's worth noting that our own environmental, uh, our science advisory board in 2020 gave us a letter saying that and urged EPA to consider potential inclusion of effects that may be less certain than likely causal. Uh, is particularly when the impacts are substantial. So there's definitely sort of a, um, a foundation laying to start considering some more of these effects. Next slide. So when we think about this in sort of a benefit context, you know, we sometimes think, next slide, and the next, I guess, too. So these graphs just sort of simply talk about how as people, we all are risk adverse in our lives. We buy insurance, we do everything. So the willingness to pay is actually much larger than, than you know, empirically than just the expected value of the outcome, particularly for when there are frank effects. 
we have both risk aversion and something called ambiguity version. We, we don't really like living in this uncertainty. So, um, so that's one plea. And uh, I, again, I think there's a, a movement afoot to do more of this in benefit cost analysis because um, you know, I often quote, uh, which I thought was John Maynard Keynes once who said, I'd rather be vaguely right than precisely wrong. And putting these zeros in is being precisely wrong. So next slide. Oop, I'm getting a blank screen. Is that not showing up? Oh, is it not showing? Yeah, this is just a quote from a report from Science and Decisions. Um, boy, I can barely see it. I don't know if it's my computer or the. I'm seeing it. Okay. Huh. I'm going to try. Can other panelists see it? Yeah, I can see it too. Okay, okay. hopefully this is the only one that's affected. So. So historically, those response assessments at EPA have been conducted differently for cancer and non-cancer effects, and the methods have been criticized for not providing the most useful results. Consequently, non-cancer effects have been underemphasized, especially in benefit-cost analysis. A consistent approach to risk assessment for cancer and non-cancer effects is scientifically feasible and needs to be implemented. That was the uh, National Academy of Sciences Science and Decision Report way back in 2009. And we've only made a tiny, tiny little bit of progress since that report's been issued. So we do quantify non-cancer health endpoints when we have epidemiology, but if we have to rely on toxicology, I don't believe that it's ever been uh, valued or quantified yet. And again, that's not really doing our job. And so it's on the one hand, we're answering questions that we want to answer, not the questions that decision makers or what a benefit cost analysis is designed to answer. Next slide. Oh boy, this whole thing is going black. Um, I'll pull up my own. Oh, there it is. Good. The show it. Okay. Yeah, good. I got it. So I think everyone knows this, but just to be clear, so the top left hand slide of the slide is. Um, the typical way we quantify cancer potency. So it's a it's a cancer slope and it gives the probability of, of a cancer risk of getting cancer for a given exposure. Economists can do a lot with that, right? Because then we can quantify the expected outcomes of cancer given a, a certain exposure to a population. Um, but on the bottom left-hand slide is the sort of reference dose or sometimes we use reference concentrations when talking about air concentrations where it's the, um, we sort of have a point of departure where our observations are. And then as uh, was alluded to earlier by one of the panel members, the, uh, we apply some uncertainty factors to get a reference dose. And typically we characterize that reference dose. My shorthand definition is that we think it's safe for exposures below the reference dose and not safe uh, for exposures above the reference dose. That's, that is an overly simplistic term, but, um, you know, I, I've made the claims elsewhere. That's that's a pretty made up paradigm in the sense that we have now, like we have a reference dose for mercury. And does anyone think that there's a, a threshold for mercury and um, and say IQ? There's no biological rationale for for such a thing. And the Science and Decisions report made uh, similar comparisons. But even if you think there are thresholds for non-cancer health effects. Next slide. This chart was taken from science and decisions. Um, we're all, of course, not the same. So we all have our own individual, uh, if thresholds do exist, we have our own individual thresholds. So in, in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go over all this, but the theme of this chart and diagram is to show that as long as we're heterogeneity across the population, and we all have our individual background doses and individual uh, dose response, sometimes with a threshold. When we aggregate that up to a population, it turns into a continuous dose response curve. That's easy to show. Science and decisions did show it. So again, we don't have to abandon a reference dose or a threshold concept necessarily if we want to go to a population dose response curve. Next 
Uh, next slide. Um, the third kind of category of benefits that we need to worry about are willingness to pay or cost of illness. Um, I, I'm always amazed, particularly in the public health field where uh, researchers want to go after the cost of illness. And so if we can avoid these health effects, society will avoid the cost of, of treating these effects. That is true, but um, it's typically uh, considered a very big lower bound. It's not even a lower bound, really. It's just a, a, a very low estimate of the total benefits to society. So um, if we look at the highlighted health effects, those are the ones where we use willingness to pay estimates for. Um, this is taken right out of BenMap. It's uh, very similar to the charts we were shown earlier. Um, and the rest of these, if we value them or use, uh, typically we use the cost of illness that would be saved if we did, could avoid these health effects. But what I want to posit in the last bullet here on the right, is that if properly constructed, willingness to pay is often additive to cost of illness. So we, it, sh it should not be one or the other. In most cases, it should be both. So take lung cancer, for example, non-fatal lung cancer. So if I did a survey, uh, you know, state we call them stated preference surveys to try to get people's willingness to pay to avoid lung cancer, I'm sure it would be very, very large. Um, but I would argue that for folks who have uh, health insurance, they're not putting into their calculus how much health care savings they're going to save society when they, if they don't get lung cancer. They're really expressing a willingness to pay based on all the worry, pain, and suffering and uh, other consequences of lung cancer, but not the most of the health care costs. And they, um, so again, uh, EPA is starting to move towards more of an additive approach to these, but I, I get most of the uh, practice, best practice is not cut up to that. Next slide. Uh, and then uh, we already talked or, uh, about labor productivity and cognitive impacts. Those are, uh, I think, gonna be huge. Uh, there's a lot of good studies on my next slide. I have some citations as well. Um, there's also an emerging literature on um, how the flu or even COVID can be worse when uh, high exposure to certain criteria air pollutants like PM. And that also, I think, could be included. Uh, there's enough literature out there, I think, now that you could begin to uh, quantify that effect as well. Um, and again, that tends to be worse in um, overburdened areas or, you know, with uh, disproportionate exposures to high levels of air pollution. And then my last category is altruism. And this definitely gets overlooked a lot. And so uh, there is a literature on this that shows that you, know, you and I might have a willingness to pay to improve the air quality of others, um, particularly again, in high exposed areas, so overburdened communities. Um, there, is, unfortunately, there is not enough empirical work done on this. There's been a little bit. Uh, Maureen Cropper and Alan Krupnik did some focus groups on this. They're both at Resources for the Future, and they were shocked actually at how big the, the, the focus groups expressed a willingness to pay to improve the air quality of others. Um, in many cases, uh, people were willing to. Uh, because they wanted that sort of equity to remove those disparities, they were willing to forego any uh, improvements in their own air quality and still have a sizable willingness to pay to improve the uh, air quality of others, particularly in the context of air toxics. So again, that that's not implementable now because we don't have enough research, but it's something I think on certainly on our radar is something that deserves uh, further scrutiny, and we're hoping that either us or the research community can sort of take that on. So, uh, next slide, finally. These are just some of the, uh, the research or the publications that we thought would be helpful in, in these things that sort of give us a stepping stone to doing this. Um, of course, we're the AIR office uh, uh, is doing some great work on all these things as, as was alluded to. So, um, but you know, these are potentially very, very large effects. And so with that, I'll conclude.
Thank you all and Pete for a great presentation. Um, Pete covers some current methodology from EPA and future consideration of including more on explore area evaluation. I really appreciate that. And also Al, you mentioned a lot of um, advanced research in the field and I'm glad to hear the EPA is also thinking of the same line of thought that we are considering. And for your information, RD, we also funded some COVID research in the state of California. And so there was another extra great information we can use for the future. So now we are ready for the second panel discussion on the valuation topic. So I'd like to have our panelists and speakers back to the um, floor. And first, are there any, again, clarifying questions to the speakers from the panelists? Tracy, I can see your hands up. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yeah, those were terrific presentations. Thank you so much. Um, I was wondering, Al, if you could talk about the, you showed the graph that shows that you can value, um, do the valuation for any level of evidence. Is there, is this being currently considered by EPA or has this been something that um, there's been development of methodology around that? It's uh, a good question. So, you know, uh, the Air Office does have the benefit of those um, scientific assessments. So, you know, and then they have the KSAC or others, panel members that or even some that weigh in on the sort of likely causal causal designations. When we work with other program offices, the water office, drinking water office, et cetera, they often do not have such uh, integrated assess scientific assessments. So, um, we're we're not as um, uh, I don't want to say handicapped, but we're not we're not dictated to what we can quantify or not. And so the good news is we have a we have the the burden of presenting that science is on the the program office and us because we often work with them directly. Um, and but we've been able to make some inroads. And then of course I have some examples in the past. So. I have an uh, one time we were doing working on a lead in drinking water regulation, and we quantify the cardiovascular mortality associated with reduced lead. That should not even be. Uh, no one can object to that, uh, given the state of what we know about that and how much uh, science is in on that. Um, so uh, we learned though that when we don't do a very good job you know, quantifying or, or carrying forward all that science and why it should be quantified. The instincts of people are to question how we can quantify that it might be speculative. So uh, I think it's, um, you know, we won't ever back off on that again. Uh, and I'm reminded, uh, Tracy, when we first did the first uh, so-called Section 812 study of the Clean Air Act, which is the report to Congress on the benefits and costs of implementing the Clean Air Act. We wanted to quantify um, infant deaths from PM and based on your work. And uh, it was the, the panel, which was not economists, but rather mostly public health folks, risk assessment folks said it was too speculative. It wasn't replicated, et cetera. And so, um, Again, I, I think we we're learning our lessons of um, if you're doing a benefit cost analysis, you really do need to carry that forward if it's um, uh, you know solid science. So, yeah. Thank you, and Rob, and then Mike next. So th thanks for those presentations. I really I really enjoyed them. Um, I I have a. Uh, maybe a naive a que question about willingness to to pay. Um, there, there, no. I think there are no economists on the on the panel, so we're all at a disadvantage. But the um, yeah, I like the notion of willing to pay, willingness to pay being something different and get may get added on to the cost of of uh, of illness. Will willingness to pay? It's Maybe one of the good things about it is that it's quite subjective. You know, it captures something integrated about people's sense of the risk. But it, I assume it suffers from from imperfect information. How do how does that 
play into this? How do how do economists think about about that? You know, what sort of perceptions people have that may not correspond to the to the true risk, either on in either direction. Yeah, excellent question. So on mortality, we're <laughs> we're in our strongest space, right? Because we have several different ways to quantify a willingness to pay from mortality risk. The first and probably the most popular way is we look at the labor markets, right? And so um, using fairly sophisticated econometrics, the Bureau of Labor Statistics takes keeps track of mortality deaths on the job across America. And it's very detailed. It's very micro data set. Um, you have to be a sworn agent of the Bureau of Labor Statistics to get access to the data because it's so it's person specific. Um, but you can use that data uh, to look at the wage premium uh, that people that employers have to pay for it to con you know to get a worker to take a risky job and control for all other factors education work attributes job attributes etc. Um, there's a rather large literature on that and that um, you know that's the one that produces a range that's actually the highest value of statistical life and so that teases out a value for a small probability and increase in depth. And those um, generally produce that range of that EPA uses around, you know, let's say roughly $10 million now. So plus or minus, you know, $3 million. Um, we also have a, what we call stated preference methods, as the name implies. So there's a really survey methods. And we work uh, with cognitive psychologists and others to try to communicate the sense of risk. Uh, and there's very ingenious ways to get at that. Some people look at um, living in a community where you're going to lower risk, but your cost of living is going to go up or your taxes are going to go up. There's all kinds of trade-offs. And hopefully we try to use trade-offs that people are used to making in their own lives and tease out a value that way. That's a second way. And the third is we can look at consumer expenditures, like how much are people pay to buy, you know, safer cars, Volvos, instead of uh, a more dangerous car, for example. So safety things, or um, that tends to give the lowest VSL in that literature, um, but that's a third class of literature. So do people understand? I think they go through the, the best practices for the survey method. You have to do focus groups, you do debriefings, et cetera, to sort of convince yourselves uh, that people do, in fact, understand what they're trying to value. But um, that's, you know, is a function, I guess, of how well the study is done, um, which might be another reason why, uh, you know, researchers or people doing practitioners of benefit cost analysis tend to glom on to the cost of illness, the medical care cost savings, because it's a far relatively easier thing to, to get at. Thank you. And Mike? Yeah, I, I too really enjoyed both the talks. So thanks to the speakers. I, I, I realize this isn't part of EPA's current mandate, but I just wanted to get your sense. You know, when you go out and deal with a lot of communities that are disproportionately affected by air pollution and other environmental risk factors, the big concern is cumulative effects. And then a very closely related concern is that people living in these communities are often more vulnerable because they have higher rates of chronic disease or um, worse workplace exposures, et cetera. Uh, so what's the state of the science on valuing cumulative effects? And, and then as an adjunct to that on taking into account um, vulnerable populations who may have a disproportionately large dose response curve? Um, again, uh, great question. That, uh, you know, I, I think like the cumulative risk assessment, the state of the science is not there for evaluation. So I, I don't, um, I mentioned the sort of, um, the idea that we're probably all willing to pay something to improve those overburdened communities, uh, disproportionate exposures. Um, that's certainly nothing we have on, on the shelf that we can use right now. Um, in fact, our typical position is we're sort of been debating this, that 
we think that the EJ analysis should be separate and distinct from the benefit cost analysis because it's um, you know it's sort of trying to shed a light and data on a different kind of problem. In benefit cost analysis, nets everything out, right? We talk about net benefits, mm -hmm. which are benefits minus costs. And when in EJ, you can't net anything out because where you start matters at disproportionate risks. And so, uh, you yeah, know, it's we were inherently thinking, distributional. Yes. And so, you, you know, you don't want to net, you want to really want the decision maker to understand the current baseline conditions and then how that regulation is going to change those baseline conditions. But the, the effects on community A should not be netted out with the effects to community B. If one's getting better and one's getting worse, they're not, they're not, uh, they don't cancel each other out in, in a distributional sense or even in a justice sense. Okay. And on the vulnerable populations, where we do see, you know, enhanced dose response functions. Yeah, well, we're we're very interested in in moving in that direction, but we don't have a, you know, uh, right now most of what we do is with indexes, and you know, I think that's the general state of the art, if you will, in the in terms of applied work, and that's very unsatisfactory. So. Whether you talk about the so-called RECI scores or others, and um, to, to me at least, the meaning of disproportionate exposures doesn't get conveyed if you're just talking about an index. And this person's index is 1.2 times, you know, this community's index, etc. So it just doesn't um, carry. I think the the goal of informing decision makers and the public about you know the current conditions. So we're working, in fact, talking to researchers, et cetera, about how to make those methods better. Um, or our Office of Research and Development has a very long run program to try to get there in a, in a very science-based way. Um, some of us are a little bit more impatient. And so we're trying to look at ways we can sort of fill those gaps while that long-term research plan kicks in as well. Thank you. Thank yes. you. Gracie, your hands stay up. Yeah, I just want to follow up on the, the point about a, accounting for cumulative impacts or factors that put people at more risk for environmental it, it, exposures, in this case, air pollution. And I just, um, he, well, Dr. Maniloff was saying that they use the sensitive, I guess you use a particular dose response. So I was, there's two things here. One is you account for the fact that it doesn't fully reflect variability in the population. So that would be one way to address this issue about variability and response. And that is a recommendation. I love Science and Decisions 2009, I'm also a big fan. And they also recommend that a, the variability factor should be bigger. And there's some approaches that have been done to do that. But that also, if you have data from one particular example, you can use that as a default approach when you don't have data in another area, which I think is really important because it you can't, like when Bob and I was talking about every community in LA, you're not gonna be able to necessarily know all their exposures, but if you know in general, what the increased risk is, maybe it's two times more for, you know, among black women for exposure to air pollution and low birth weight, that could be replicated as a default factor. So I wonder if you guys could comment on that. So that's something that we've been discussing. Um, and we see, you know, in the literature, we, so we see different response functions by a variety of different demographic groups, right? Uh, but we haven't, I would say we haven't found them for everything we're trying to value. Um, you know, we, we generally have baseline data, but uh, the baseline incidence data is also sometimes missing at the fine spatial resolution. And so then that leads you to the question of, you know, for each of those, how do you fill in the blanks or do you? Um, this is one of the questions we're confronting now, absolutely. Right, but I guess I would say you probably shouldn't end with zero, right? <laughs> well, um, 
I would say we're not currently assuming that it's a zero, right? We're currently implicitly assigning an average. I got it, right. Yeah. And Bhavna? I just had a question about the cost benefit analysis being untethered from the EJ analysis. I'm wondering if you've um, had any resistance to this idea. I mean, I think that, or kind of where that you think that might follow out into the future, because I do think that the cost benefit analysis doesn't take into account that all things are not valued equally. And so that uh, some communities have been devalued. And, you know, and I, I think we have a long history of, you know, lots of institutional infrastructure uh, policy efforts that create kind of an uneven landscape for cost benefit analysis. So I think does cost benefit analysis take that into account and unlinking them from EJ might be a good idea, but is that like a palatable thing in the EPA? How is it received? What's the plan? It, yeah, I, I think it depends on how one implements the benefit cost analysis. So you, you're right. I think there's been you know, some people looking at, um, like if you take water quality to pick the example outside of air, right? And so one, we looked at water quality on the Chesapeake Bay. And so one effect of improving water quality in the Chesapeake Bay is it raises the property values of homes that are on the shoreline of the Chesapeake Bay, right? Well, who's on the shores of, of you know, if there tend to be high income, nice houses that have the biggest benefit there. And so if that drives your decision, uh, that would be yeah, very unfortunate, right? And so, um, but we're now thinking about the Chesapeake Bay much more holistically. And uh, so I think it really is a function of how you structure the benefit cost analysis. So my point about making it separate from uh, the environmental justice analysis is one, the environmental justice now should be free, freer to have you know, more degrees of freedom to mm -hmm. take a deeper dive into some of the issues that are raised like that. And a lot of that is really of um, like benefit cost analysis typically doesn't worry about the baseline conditions, right? They're kind of irrelevant. We're just looking at the marginal impact of the, of the regulation. And so where you start really doesn't matter as much, at least the way the tools have been developed. And in EJ analysis, where the baseline is deep. Um, and the other I think point that I made is that in, um, in benefit cost analysis, you, even in the forms that we fill out, we have benefits and then costs and then net benefits. And that's usually for the entire country. And so we lose any sense of spatial um, or distribution of the benefits. And so in an EJ, now, you know, any kind of distributional justice question, it's not just how big are the benefits and how big are the costs, it's who's getting the benefits and who's, you know, bearing the costs. And those kinds of factors come out much better if you design an analysis to, to highlight those things. Yeah. And a, another example, the AIM Act, the, we were... EPA recently did a, a, a rule on phasing out HFCs, powerful greenhouse gas uh, emissions. And so we did a benefit and cost analysis on that. And so we looked at the cost of substitutes. The good news is most of the substitutes are actually cheaper than the, the, the HFCs themselves. So that's good. Uh, so the costs were quite small, but um, the benefits were mostly the greenhouse gas um, you know, benefits. But what didn't come out in the benefit cost analysis, but did come out in the EJ analysis, similar to the cap and trade issues with climate, um, the way EPA was implementing the AIM Act is to create these like production allowances that were tradable. So as we phased out HFCs, we would reduce the amount of allowances, production allowances that would be in the economy each year. Um, well, that meant that the concentration of producing this stuff, instead of being produced HFC is being produced to say a dozen plants across the country. It might concentrate into certain areas, right? And so you could see the ben the spatial benefits of you know of reduced HFCs going down in some places and up in other places. And then what about the 
production of the substitutes, some of the substitutes could be toxic and certainly the production of them at chemical plants, these are mainly refrigerants and stuff, could be toxics as well. And so the benefit cost analysis did not look at that issue. The EJ analysis was able to shine a light on that very issue that it wasn't really the HFCs themselves that might pose the environmental justice concern, but rather the emerging pattern of where these things are going to be produced and the associated air toxics emissions from them. And the rule actually was able to address that head on in the proposed rule. Yeah. I would add one more tension. And like it's not just that these are different questions, the distributional and the benefit costs, but there's often a direct tension that our measures of the costs such as willingness to pay generally increase with income. Right. And so people who have more money have a higher willingness to pay. And so if we start taking the heterogeneity seriously, you know, we can discuss, you know, it's an open question as to whether that's the appropriate way to do a benefit cost analysis or not. But if we do, it pushes directly against thinking about you know, prioritizing impacts on lower income or socioeconomic status or otherwise marginalized communities. Anthony? Hi, um, that was one of the questions I had. Uh, thank you, Dr. Madeloff, for <laughs> preemptively answering it because I felt that we've had uh, behavioral changes are suggested, but some of those have to do with income as well. So mm -hmm. people, even if the filtration unit can be created simply, people are quite worried about the cost of electricity mm -hmm. nowadays and may not wish to run it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and you also... Um, spoke uh, Dr. Garland, Gartland to my other question about spatial analysis as well. Um, that it seems like a spatial estimate of benefits would be important to understanding, like you said, who's bearing the cost and who's getting the benefit. Um, and I wanted to thank both of you for your excellent presentations. And it was super exciting to hear of approaches to value um, benefits um, associated with evaluating effects that were strongly suggestive or suggestive, which I think is really the way we should be going here. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm hearing a lot of agreement from you guys that this is really the way to go towards in the future. Um, and you did make the comment, I believe, that you know, the empirical literature is way out in front. And that's certainly something that we're seeing is there's a lag time to to really um being able to synthesize and determine something's likely causal it is a definite lag time when there's a lot of very strong literature already out there and many of these endpoints that you've mentioned so i'd like to thank you very much for for your excellent presentations and for your forward-looking thinking thank you thank you Tony. actually we are kind of now asking clarifying question and also kind of discussion. So I think the similar to our first discussion, here is a list of questions that we prepare for active conversation and Rob is willing to kind of moderate this portion of the um, discussion. So May, can you share the, um, the slide? And Rob, if you have any other clarifying question, you can ask and otherwise you can start discussion among panelists and speakers on values and topics. Thanks. So, so maybe I'll just open it up to questions from the uh, questions or comments from the panel. I see Irva, you've got your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a question about the um, maybe I maybe I I might have uh, spaced out a little bit at one point, but uh, when you're talking about the willingness to pay. Um, my understanding from at one point I looked into this around some specific topic uh, probably 20 years ago and I don't remember all the details but what I recall is that there was a um a an issue of when like how far out those benefits are and that when people see it as being farther in the future they're less willing to pay um but but I I always wondered in those cases where, you know, many people who have child, children 
if you actually talk to them, they're more willing to pay for a benefit for their child's future, their child now or their child's future than um, necessarily not, you know, than for themselves or their, you know, the, the people older than them. Um, and, uh, you know, I wonder how, how, how that might play into what we're talking about here. Um, th things that seem more immediate versus things that, um, are not so much this issue of children, but just that issue of of timing. Um, and, and I also just wanted to comment on it sort of really harkened back, like, you know, decades ago when I was a graduate student and worked for for um, for uh, um, what, what later became Cal ETA, uh, was um, uh, the this whole thing about everything was focused on cancer, cancer, cancer. And we, you know, I wrote a lot of risk assessments where we just glossed over because there wasn't data, there wasn't a protocol really that was useful um, for evaluating the non-cancer endpoints. So finally, we're, we're, we're really, I mean, at least here in California, we're, <laughs> we're getting, I think we're pretty far, far moving pretty far from that, but um, it brought back memories. <laughs> Yeah. Well, on your issue of sort of willingness to pay over time, there is definitely a lot of literature that shows that we're all, uh, we all discount the future somewhat. So the further we can put it off, it's not a dramatic uh, impact in general, but it's not, you know, over, if you say you want to, you know, have cancer now or non-fatal cancer now or non fatal cancer, you know, 20 years from now, there's definitely more uh, of a response, a bigger willingness to pay to, you know, if it's now. So uh, there's, that's been repeated many, many times. So uh, yeah. and I think economists would say that's sort of the rational response. <laughs> but uh, so, um, yeah. which is but it's related. also related to severity too and how, yeah. How right. people view some things as being really scary and others being oh you know oh shoot you know yep. that's a good point we didn't get into it but oftentimes we have a a, a study or two on a, on a value for a willingness to pay for some uh health effect but it doesn't it's either a less severe type of that health effect and so we because of the scarcity or the dearth of, of good studies we often use things that are we want to be conservative kind of thing we make that mistake as well on the valuation side so there is a an approach that carrie smith and others have done so called preference calibration and so um using a bunch of public health studies that we're able to sort of peg where certain health endpoints come out in a sort of preference calibration side and so if we have an anchor say for chronic bronchitis and again that depends on the severity as well but if we have an we have an estimate for that we can sometimes if we know this other health endpoint is worse than chronic bronchitis in people's minds we might be able to calibrate the willingness to pay based on the data that we do have um, we don't do that a lot but it has been used as a way to fill in the blanks yeah well thank you both of you for your very informative presentations. Um, I, I, I just, I do also want to sort of second um, Bobsna's uh, comments about the EJ side and and how imp how important it would be to try to link that in and not have that be a completely separate sort of uh, at least I think for for CDPH and CARB. Um, that would be something I think we'd want to do as we think about our prioritizations and, and valuation that that combining um, cost benefit and the the values that um, our EJ communities may have that may actually differ and um, bring up really, you know, whose priority and whose benefit uh, and, and putting that a bit more front and center in uh, in whatever comes out of this this whole process. Yep. Tracy, 
Yeah, I just wanted to bring it back to opportunities for evaluation. I know you put up some priorities out. I, I just wanted to, I'm not sure if you responded, but the idea that um, is the valuation accounting for how we might have higher value for health effects in children compared to adults. I don't know if the valuation that you guys have do that, but it seems like, for example, like the value for asthma seems kind of low and a lot of the non-cancer health effects are lower than mortality. And is it, I guess there's two questions. One, is there an opportunity that they could be higher if there was more research? And what do you think is the high, the highest priority for if, like, for example, someone was going to invest some resources into doing valuation studies to improve the basis of the numbers for that, what you would pick? Uh, good question. So we we actually entered into a, a partnership, the OECD uh, in Paris. Um, it turns out that the EU countries are very interested in benefit cost analysis as well, and they're suffering from the same paucity of studies, et cetera. And so the, the OECD actually um, got a bunch of us together. We all contribute and they developed the survey instrument. I talked before about the sort of state of preference service who would get re real willingness to pay estimates. Um, and we jointly uh, make some determination about what health effects, what health endpoints we're gonna look at um, it turns out to be a very cost-effective way to do it. I would be happy or pleased to send the the first round of reports that are coming out from the OECD. And there, we all are interested, I think, in doing a second round this year, so because it is so cost-effective. Um, but we had what was interesting about that is that we did have a big problem trying to settle on what are the most you know highest priority outcomes because the the Europeans not, don't necessarily have the same regulatory agenda we do. So we were looking at chemicals that we knew were coming up on the horizon and they're, they have their own. Um, but we, uh, I think we remain open to um, suggestions in that regard as well. So we're about to enter that second year. But, um, but we think the kids stuff is a particularly uh, fertile area. Um, for a lot of reasons. One, there is not a lot of studies. Two, uh, you know, we're beginning to understand the, how kids are affected by, you know, different chemicals and different exposures, et cetera. So, um, and, and three, it is helpful from a, a children's health protection and environmental justice uh, point of view as well. So, um, so uh, I don't know. I mean, it, to me, I, I Try to work backwards from the reg agenda, and given that a valuation study takes at least a year uh, to get you know completed, that's a minimum. And then if you think about peer review and stuff afterwards, so uh, I'm trying to sort of forecast where we will be with our regulatory agenda in a year and a half or two years. Um, but there's certainly big gaps on, on the kids' side. So um, even thinking about you know where the risk assessment community is going to be, is it like obesity or learning disabilities or other things and you know um for lead and mercury we've done iq point losses but that's such a small it's a big number from a benefits point of view but it's still a tiny number compared to the cognitive impacts of of heavy metals on kids so uh being able to tell a more complete story there would be fantastic um, So um, I'll I'll uh, ask a ask a question. Uh, one of the one of the themes, you know, the in the challenges to valuation. One of the themes I think has been uncertainty and how you how you take account of uncertainty in providing a complete uh, picture to to uh, policymakers and to the public, um, and uh, you know. We've seen we've seen a few a few examples here, but one one thing that occurs to me is, yeah, when we do when EPA does health impact assessment, where BenMap is 
sort of the final the final stop or one of the final stops before you before you get to the policy makers uh you know there's this whole process that goes before it to get to the endpoints that you're willing to make a um you're willing to make a, a an assessment of you know a health impact assessment and i know dr maniloff through uh an advisory committee to 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 ben map and i i know th i know the answer to the to the question but i'm going to i'm going to ask it anyway there's you know i think there you know it's such a great tool and uh it's something that could be could be useful for the kind of work that carb is thinking of doing and it's the sort of thing that could be useful to to the broader scientific community um and uh so i i i know that you know epa and dr maniloff they have a job to get done and uh but there there there's a lot of potential there i think to to to, to help clarify the uncertainty to produce estimates that you don't have the time time to produce and and in particular yeah i i think of some of the comments that that mike made earlier you know the approach of the ipcc where you know in one way or another you could just take you know the different bins you could make estimates of the health impact assessment uh and you know you could allow people to 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 explore what you know explore different avenues using using a, a tool like benmap and it, i think there are two things in particular that you could that would be quite useful to the to the regulatory community one is you know if you had a lot of people going out and estimating estimating health impact assessments of different outcomes i think you might identify some new targets mm -hmm. because they'd be such big effects or or not but you might you might mm -hmm. find some some large effects that you hadn't hadn't anticipated and i think you could also use it for in sort of the same exploratory line you know it would create research a uh, body of research on all these new exposures that are available all the composition data or the mixtures mixtures data you know you could you could use you could use ben maps to estimate what those effects are and i think they would be helpful to epa to think about what the important ones what the important ones are you know what what are the ones that mm -hmm. maybe more research could be should be done on and potentially could be regulatory targets in the in the future so i know the answer <laughs> but i'm going to ask you if you thought about that <laughs> or has or maybe more more to the point has carb thought about that you know every everybody goes and reinvents the real wheel when mm. they want to do uh, a health impact assessment and if the community had had a a tool that was fairly user friendly and flexible i think a lot more could be done um so a couple comments so yeah that, that that's a great vision um and I, I think what everything you described would be doable now with the desktop existing desktop version of binmap um, that allows users to specify their own functions for both the uh, epi side and the valuation side or both the concentration response stage and the valuation stage we that's not currently implemented in the cloud version uh, but it's on our list of features that we plan to add uh depending on resource queuing on um, on the second on the other gen broader topic of uh uncertainty uh i'll just note as dr mcconnell knows um this sab panel has a couple questions uh as a couple charge questions on how we should consider uncertainty and both uncertainty uh in the health sciences linking exposures to health endpoints and uncertainty in economic valuation and so we'll look forward to reading what that panel has to say thank you um 
I think we are now kind of closing close to the uh, time limit. And so thank you for the great discussion and question and answers. And I think now I'd like to, I mean, before that, are there any more last following questions or comments? If not, thank you, Rob, for the moderating. And thank you, Al and Peter, again, for a great presentation. So now I'd like to hand it over back to Dr. May Batratana to remind everyone how the public comment period will be run. May? Yeah, thanks, Dr. Park. So I um, appreciated the discussions uh, so far, which has been really good. So now we are open for public comment. So if you would like to provide verbal comment, you may raise your hand to be added to the speaking queue. I know we already have uh, some who have. Leave your hand raised until you're called upon to provide your comment and comments are being limited to two minutes. And when the two minutes are up, we will kind of gently remind you to, to wrap up your comment. Um, Following this meeting, there will be an online public comment log that will be open, uh, and it's not open yet, but uh, registrants will receive a notice when this is open for submissions. So with that, I will turn it over to Bonnie Holmes-Jen and Arash Moheg to uh, moderate the public comment period. Thank you, May. Um, so we have four people with their hands raised right now. Um, I'm going to call them um, and also call the people who I'm going to uh, call later in advance so they have a heads up. Um, we are going to remind you to um, that we have multiple commenters. So if you can stick to the two minute time allocated, to, uh, that would be great. At the end of the two minutes, I will give you a reminder that the time is up and if you have any concluding sentence. Um, and also just a reminder that we can only allow um, you to turn on your microphone, but we cannot turn your microphone on directly. So you have to do that yourself. So we are going to have comments from uh, Jeffrey Kilbreth, um, James Enstrom, Stan Young, and Christine Wolf in that order. Uh, Jeffrey, I'm going to turn, allow you to. Uh, turn on your microphone. If you would like to unmute yourself and give your comment, please do so. Uh, Jeffrey, would you like to unmute yourself and give your comment? Yeah, I'm, I'm set now, sorry. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Um, okay, um, um, I'm on the um, uh, Richmond San Pablo uh, AB 617 Community Steering Committee. Um, I guess that makes me a customer of um, all of this work. Um, and I co-chair the Public Health Subcommittee. Um, uh, just a few quick reactions that I, you know, would maybe I'll send a longer email about some of these things, but that I think are important for you to be mulling over as you, as you imagine, um, you know, improving uh, both the research and the, um, the guidelines the, and the tools, as we were just discussing. Tools are important, simple spreadsheets, things we can actually use in permitting environments, et cetera. Okay, so um, uh, a couple of things, you know, it's very clear to us that we're deficient in understanding health outcomes, but there are priorities here and we, want, and we need speed. So the more we can do with mice, you know, the better. I love Dr. Alkindi's uh, presentation, you know, uh, and, um, you know, we need to really test a lot of chemicals, a lot of emissions to see how much they move certain needles and then, then, then you know, then we're then we're much more confident, and we should focus on kids and on seniors in terms of health impacts. I mean, these are the two groups that suffer the most in terms of chronic conditions, and it's very clear to us. Richmond is, um, uh, you know, eighty percent working class. The average income, family income, is half the county average. Um, 
and it's home to the biggest refinery on the west coast of North America. So, you know, we 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 know who's suffering, and and it's pervasive. The use of um, you know inhalers in schools is off the charts compared to Palo Alto or something like that. So you get you get the idea. We want we need focus, and we need a lot more information about health outcomes in the schools and in with seniors. Um, um, your two minutes is up. If you have any concluding sentence. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, all right, so two things we need help with right now uh, are we, you know, we've, we've identified the top 13 toxic area uh, attacks and the top three caps. We need help understanding the relative value of reducing different ones. You know, we're writing a community emission reduction plan, plan and we don't know whether we whether a ton of NOx and ozone reduction is the same or different than a ton of PM 2.5 reduction. Same thing for the tax. And then the other question that's that's difficult for us I is think we, we do need to conclude if you could just state it very short in a very yeah, I will. brief sense. Um, spikes, monitoring spikes. We have a lot of uh, monitoring data that's showing uh, you know very short uh, measurements at 30 or 40 times the average, you know, what we don't know what to make of this, you know, in other words, it's not an hour long thing, you know, it's not an eight hour thing. It's a, you know, 30 second thing or a minute thing or something like that. So it's confusing. We need help. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think it's Jeffrey, correct. Thank you so much for your comments. Um, in your ideas um, and, and telling us the areas where you need help. That's all very helpful information to us. Um, and we will consider all that in our work on expanding health analysis. So we do invite you to submit um, additional comments or if you had additional um, comments you, you wanted to make or any additional information in our written docket. So we'll go ahead and go on to the next person. Thanks. Thank you for your comments. Um, Next, um, we have James Enstrom. Um, James, I'm going to allow you to turn, uh, unmute yourself. If you would like to give your comment, please unmute yourself. Hello, um, I'm Dr. James Enstrom. Since 2002, I've done extensive epidemiologic uh, research that shows there are no significant air pollution health effects in California. CARB unprofessionally ignores null evidence from me and many other accomplished scientists. Also, CARB-funded scientists are unwilling to examine my evidence of no air pollution deaths in California and Jennifer Hernandez's evidence that CARB policies undermine economic, civil rights, and racial equity in California. Air pollution in California is at a record low level and cannot realistically be lowered because up to 30% of California pollution comes from heavily polluted places like China. Because people spend most of their time indoors Actual personal exposure to air pollution is much lower than the ambient air levels measured by CARB. CARB needs to sponsor a day-long seminar on air pollution health effects that allows equal time for presentation of evidence from CARB-funded scientists, CARB critics like myself, and impacted California business groups. CARB held such a seminar in February 2010. CARB must realize that competitor nations like communist China tolerate much higher levels of air pollution in order to gain an economic advantage over America. It is very important that CARB address the extensive criticism from me, Jennifer Hernandez, numerous other scientists, and hundreds of adversely impacted California business groups. In any case, this criticism will continue and will increase until we can stop unjustified CARB regulations. Thank you for the opportunity to speak for two minutes. Okay, uh, well, thank you for your comments. Um, 
as I said, we don't have time for extensive um, responses to comments, but I did want to note that the health impacts of fine uh, particle pollution have been has been established by decades of scientific research and thousands of studies across the globe documenting mortality and morbidity impacts. And we've discussed many of those today. Um, but um, if you do have uh, any information that you would like to submit, uh, please feel free to submit that to the docket. And uh, at this point, we'll move on to our next speaker. Thank you for your comment. Um, next, we have Stan Young. Uh, Stan, I'm going to um, allow you to unmute yourself. If you would like to, please go ahead and provide your comment. Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. I'm S. Stanley Young. You work in the literature, a PhD in statistics and genetics. I'm a fellow of the American Statistical Association and the AAAS. I've studied environmental epidemiology for over 10 years. I was a member of the EPA Scientific Advisory Board from 2017 to 2021. I obtained the, all the death certificate data for California for the years 2000 to 2012, 2 million records. We looked at all cause, respiratory, cardiovascular deaths for all ages and older adults. We looked at the eight most populated air bases. We computed more than 70,000 statistical analyses in the course of our work. We published our work in 2017 we found no evidence of effects for PM or ozone on mortality. We made our data set public in 2015. To my knowledge, no one has disputed our results. A WHO funded study was reported in 2020. They gave the risk ratio of one is no effect. They reported a risk ratio so close to one, 1 1.0065, as to be considered no effect. Much of the history of air components and health effects is covered in a public report I co-authored for the National Association of Scholars. It is time for CARB to get the data for the years 2013 to 2022 and make it public so that everyone can look at the, at the data. My results are transparent, CARB regulation should be based on transparent public data. Uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Stan, for your for comment. And again, the, the health effects of, um, of particle pollution are well established by a large body of scientific evidence, um, particle pollution and ozone pollution. And, and this evidence has served as the basis for the state and federal um, national ambient air quality standards in California, air quality standards. Um, so um, we, we appreciate your, your comment. Um, if you do want to provide specific information on the study that you just commented on um, or other research, you're welcome to uh, submit that to the docket and, and we will look at that. So at this point, we can move on uh, to the next commenter. Is there somebody else? Yes. Uh, thank you for your comment. Uh, we have two more people. Uh, we have Christine Wolf and uh, Lily Wu. Uh, they have raised their hand. Oh, just another one. Uh, Beverly Deschau. I hope I'm not mispronouncing their name. Um, so Christine, I'm going to allow you to unmute yourself. If you would like to provide your comment, please unmute yourself and do so. Hi, this is Christine Wolf from the California Council for Environmental and Economic Balance. Thank you for the presentations and the discussion today. I have a, a few comments and questions. Um, first, I'm hoping Research Division could give some clarification on how you plan to move forward on considering the discussion today. We had submitted public comment during last year's health endpoints update, uh, but there was no additional public process after the initial workshop comment period. And given there's no predetermined process guiding CARB's work in this area under the Clean Air Act or Health and Safety Code, uh, 
um, it's important for CARB to clearly communicate to the public what the process would be to make changes to your policies prior to doing so. Uh, one specific question for the speakers and panelists. Uh, multiple speakers spoke about the intersection of environmental, economic, and social burdens faced by the same communities. Given that the large-scale societal changes proposed by significant climate and multi-pollutant rulemakings will have both beneficial and detrimental impacts, including on social determinants of health, it'd be interesting to hear how you all see future work developing that better categorizes all potential health benefits and detriments of major rulemaking, which would include the impacts you discussed today, as well as impacts from worker displacement and increased individual household costs. This seems particularly important in the context of better understanding and addressing cumulative impacts, susceptibility, and vulnerability. Uh, lastly, I'll note that these kinds of discussions could serve as a helpful educational tool for non-public health experts, uh, but to do so, CARB would need to provide more orientation on how scientific studies are developed, as well as what significance, uncertainty, and causality mean and how they're accounted for. Thank you, and we look forward to hearing continued information from CARB and public health experts on how to address these important issues. Okay. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your comment. And um, I think we we tried to outline in the bulletin that you all have some of the next steps uh, in our expanded health analysis in a in a general way that we are going to be pursuing additional updates and improvements uh, to our health analysis, including uh, possibly consideration of additional causation categories or um, endpoints for additional pollutants and, and evaluation of uh, different approaches or methodologies for health analysis. But we will, as I mentioned earlier, we'll have a, a separate uh, public process and public meetings um, to discuss any specific proposals that we are putting forward. So we are taking into account all this information um, that's been presented today and the discussion and the public comments as we go forward. And we will be back in touch about future steps. Uh, again, we greatly appreciate uh, the input. And uh, if you do wanna submit anything to the docket, please, uh, please go ahead and do that. And we'll have that available soon after the meeting. Thank you. We can go on to the next speaker. Thank you. Um, next, we have Lily Wu. Lily, I'm going to allow you to unmute yourself. If you have a comment, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Yes, thank you. Hi, I'm Lily Wu. I am a toxicologist with the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment and work closely with staff in the uh, Community Air Protection Program, AB 617. And I wanted to first thank all the panelists and speakers today for the very diverse conversation that hit a lot of um, I think points that I don't envy CARB having to balance all of these uh, different variables and trying to um, formulate how health outcomes and their valuation uh, really fit into this bigger picture. Some of the things that I thought were particularly necessary to um, uplift and, and consider for your balancing act is that um, while models answer some questions that are very um, hard to do in real life, I, I think that there is the complement of risk assessment. And while it's not a perfect science also, um, I think that both are necessary. So to the point of some of the speakers about the length of time it takes to get empirical data to figure out some of these health outcomes, which are very diverse, cancer and non-cancer as two major headings, but even to tease out some of the non-cancer health outcomes, such as asthma, birth outcomes, um, neurodevelopmental mental health type type issues um, to, to tie that to air pollution, I think is is difficult at best, even near impossible in my mind, because as a toxicologist, we have different routes of exposure for our, um, you know, toxicants in our environment. And so to that effect, for recognizing that we're staying within the airspace, um, I just really highly encourage trying to think about teasing out some of those complex mixtures, because while we do understand some things about specific chemicals, 
we really need to advance the science of complex risk assessment as well. So I see my time's almost up, but I just hope that there's a balance to all of this. Thank you so much, um, Lily, for your comments. And we look forward to continuing to work with you and our agency partners and appreciate you pointing out the, the complexities of, of mixtures. And we will certainly take that into account. Um, I think we can move on if there are any more public comments or else we can move to our closing comments of our panelists. Are, are there other public speakers? Um, we have one, okay, now two. Um, okay, I think we're gonna one. have to cut it off at, at these two then. Okay, be the last so two. the first would be Beverly um, and next one would be Jet uh, Holtzman. Um, Beverly, I'm going to allow you to unmute yourself. Um, if you would like to, please unmute yourself and provide your comment. Hi, this is Beverly Show. I'm the president of the Electric Auto Association of the Central Coast. And all of these studies to prove that we have a problem with air pollution are like saying, are the studies to show that smoking was a problem. There's one thing that's causing all of this and that needs to be addressed. The environmental justice issues in Los Angeles, there are, there are oil wells down there, gas being pumped right now in the, in the urban areas. We need to close them down. We need to stop burning fossil fuel. That's the answer to all of it. These other things are like the child goes into the, into the kitchen and, and, oh, there's a fire on the stove. Oh, well, what can we do? Maybe we could put uh, heat, heat sensitive gloves on the child so they don't, oh, wait, the kitchen's on fire. Oh, okay, send the child out and put in some box fans. Oh, oh, wait, no, outside, no, the whole forest is on fire. The planet is on fire. The IPCC uh, report says that. We need to just have all of the people who are for these health uh, initiatives to be uh, uh, speaking to CARB about actually stopping the use of fossil fuel. The, the governor just vetoed a bill that was passed by both houses of the legislature uh, that would allow for uh, EV charging in multifamily housing where half the people of California live. That's an environmental justice thing. They can't charge there so they can't get electric vehicles so they can't reduce the pollution from the electric vehicles, which 41% of California's emissions are coming from vehicles. On the central coast, 70% of emissions are coming from vehicles and people can't get them because they can't charge at home. Please, the, the issues are so much larger and I realize that this you are oriented towards health and I'm sorry that I am, no, I'm not sorry. No, I, I think that we need to be, um, um, speaking for closing down the burning of fossil fuel and transitioning to renewables. Thank you for your work and please up it to the bigger picture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. And, um, you know, we, we certainly are working very hard at CARB, both on reducing air pollutants and, and reducing climate change impacts. And so uh, it is, they are difficult challenges ahead of us. Thank you for your comments on that. Um, so we will have we will have our last speaker now. Um, I believe that's Beverly Deshaux. Is that correct? No, that was the. Oh, the I'm sorry. The yes. previous. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, we have Jet uh, Holtzman. Okay. Jet, I'm going to allow you to unmute yourself. If you have a comment, please go ahead. Thank you so much, and thank you to all participants for your great presentations and discussion today. My name is Jed Holtzman. I'm a senior associate with RMI. Um, I just wanted to uh, speak in favor of the process today. Ultimately, if we're going to use cost-benefit analyses at all in our policy decision-making, we need to make sure that the enumeration of benefits is as complete as the enumeration of costs. To that end, definitely want to speak in favor of the continued work to reach a point where more than the three previously discussed endpoints can be officially uh, valued and considered for rulemaking purposes. 
I also, um, just in terms of some of the discussion around, um, uh, I guess, uh, expanding the discussion around specificity levels to the public, uh, wanted to put out the idea of presenting these data to the board when rulemaking decisions are going to be taking place without explicit values assigned um, when those are not feasible to assign but the directional data is still very clear and that data can be presented in a qualitative fashion to the board for them to be able to use as part of their decision making process i think that would be very useful uh, lastly uh, there was some discussion around how mortality generally swamps uh, a lot of the other uh, valued health benefits. Similarly, I think the valuation of PM 2.5 impacts often swamps the consideration of impacts from any other pollutants, but do want to put a word in for considering NO2, O3 toxics. We saw in the presentations today that all of those were related to uh, health impacts uh, and to that uh, effect in order to do a complete uh, benefit evaluation those need to be included uh, in the final analysis thanks so much for the time okay thank you thank you so much uh, Jed for your comments and um, your uh, suggestions going forward and I did want to note you might want to take a look at our um, 2022 scoping plan appendix G public health analysis where we do present um, directional and qualitative data on health benefits of reducing uh, greenhouse gases and moving forward to carbon neutrality as one example. But anyway, thank you, thank you for your suggestions, um, both on looking at um, other pollutants and ways we can improve our process. Okay, I think that is that is the last speaker. So now, thank you um, to all of our speakers. I think we're going to put up the slide. Um, uh, with all of the speakers, uh, my, my, my quick closing comment is that I'd like to thank the CARB staff um, who organized this meeting, as well as our speakers, panelists, um, our colleagues, and members of the public who participated and those who made comments. We greatly appreciate the scientific information, the ideas and insights we've received today, and we'll consider this in our health analysis work going forward. So I'd like to invite the panelists to make closing comments. I'm just going to go down the list. Um, so we'll start with uh, Dr. Hertz Pichotto, please. You have some closing comments. I think Alba just left because she's another commitment. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I think Dr. Jared had to leave. Um, Dr. McConnell. Yeah, maybe I'll just make uh, one uh, one final comment on uh, sort of echoing what the thoughtful comments of uh, of Jed, who just spoke, and um, the importance of of adequately accounting for the benefits in addition to the costs, which in some ways are more easy to uh, to quantify. And I just one one issue that didn't come up today is the the uh, sort of the cost benefit ratio of air pollution regulation and. I don't know the exact figures. Maybe the folks from EPA, uh, the economists from EPA, do. But but the air, air pollution regulation is one of the one of the most cost effective uh, uh, regulations that that the country does. It you know the the return the return on investment in reducing uh, air pollution is just enormous, and it's many fold uh, it's many fold to one. Thank you. Thank you so much. And for your earlier comments in the discussion too, appreciate that. Um, Dr. Quintana. Hi, um, I'd like to thank all those speakers and panelists for thoughtful comments. Um, I guess my takeaway from everything I've heard is uh, I was very pleased to hear about the progress on economic valuations that consider methods to assess benefits, including health effects that are not causal or likely causal, but are strongly suggestive or suggestive. And so I think that's a really uh, important 
information that was presented and I encourage CARB to consider that. I also was um, very interested to hear discussion of the importance of finer geographic scales um, that might uh, both reveal, you know, increased risk by certain communities and the benefits of reduction to those communities if it's on a finer spatial scale for assessing exposure and um, emissions. And also comments about assessing and quantifying and trying to apply, as I think uh, Dr. Woodruff said at the end, methods that account for increased uh, risks and impacts on certain eth ethnic and racial uh, groups. And uh, I'd like to encourage uh, the inclusion of evaluating the impacts on communities. Um, I know that new endpoints, new health endpoints have been added, but also um, the impacts of those health conditions are more widely um, being evaluated as was brought up by the health economists. So uh, I'd like to thank everyone for the very interesting um, methods and paths forward that were presented. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Quintana. And thank you for all of your um, insights and um, points, a very helpful point that you made in the discussion. Really appreciate it. And Dr. Shama Sunder, thank you so much for both participating in the panel and providing a presentation also. Uh, do you have some closing comments? Are you still here? I am here. That's great. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think everyone has captured a lot of, um, you know, we have been thinking hard about these issues and I, I think I appreciate the public comment um, to be able to incorporate some of the feedback we've heard from the public as we think about it more. Awesome. Thank you so much um, for all of your participation and presentation. And then we'll turn to Dr. Woodruff. Do you have some closing comments today? <clears throat> yes, thank you. And thank you to everyone who participated in the meeting. Uh, I wanted to, there's a couple things. First, I want to note the importance, um, this came up as a thread, but we, it hasn't really been an area that we've spoken a lot about, but the evidence evaluation is so critical to identifying the strength of the evidence, which then can support the quantification. We've had a lot of discussion about this, but um, methods have been improved in environmental health. I think um, Stephanie mentioned that they're doing a systematic review. And I think that this is really very foundational and I would like to see California adopt this. The IRIS program at EPA is using it. Um, the Drinking Water Office used it, I think, in part for their new standards on PFAS. And what it shows is that you can have a much more rigorous, uh, transparent and consistent approach to evidence evaluation that provides a bottom line summary of the strength of the evidence, which then feeds into what Jenny was saying about um, it allows you to then grade, particularly for these non-cancer health effects, whether it's suggestive or suspected, and to then value those health endpoints. I think the other value of it is that it aggregates all the literature together. And so you can identify whether you need to do any more health studies on that topic. For example, it wouldn't be prudent for CARB to invest in any more mortality studies because there's plenty of studies on that in PM 2.5. Um, so I think that's the other value of this. I feel like that's the same thing about birth weight and pregnancy outcomes. There have been I don't know how many there is, but there was the systematic review that was presented. I know we've done our own reviews. There's dozens of studies. I would suspect that the reason that EPA's evaluation is um, suggestive is because their evidence evaluation methods for the criteria or pollutants are not really concordant with best practices and systematic reviews. I know that's a little bit uh, provocative, but I think that if you used a better method, you would see a stronger evidentiary basis for that. And the value is then you don't have, you can put research into these other health effects and other air pollutants that currently are undervalued. So I really, uh, I feel like even if you weren't gonna do more on PM 2.5 because you have all these other air toxics, some of the people talk about this. I think Bobna mentioned it, like one of the concerns from the community is dry cleaners and 
um, auto body shops. Well, those pollution emissions are things like air toxics, like perchloroethylene and trichloroethylene and, and other solvents that, um, as I'll mention, there is methods to value those non-cancer health effects and CARB could be using those. And we, I think you would see much more identifiable health risks from those. And we published ourselves on perchloroethylene and how using standard methods, you can see that the risk from perchloroethylene to, neuro to neurological outcomes is actually quite high. So it could be used to value these health effects. So I think those are all, I think, ways that CARB can be a leader. And it's, they have been a leader in the air pollution field and can continue to be a leader um, on behalf of the public. So thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much uh, for your comments and all your participation. And let's make sure that we circle back with you and make sure we have all the information that you're uh, referring to on these methods for evidence evaluation. Make sure we have all that um, for our staff to review. Okay, um, thank you everybody for hanging in for almost four hours. It's been an incredibly um, informative and insightful meeting. And again, we are greatly appreciative and thankful to all of the scientific experts that have joined us today and participated in some robust discussion. Here's a few nice shots of our staff having a, a nice moment, fun moment together outside of our building. And uh, have a wonderful afternoon and we'll close the meeting now. Take care. Thank you, everyone, again. Thanks. Thank you.